This is Jocko Podcast number 175 with Echo Charles and me, Jocko Willink. Good evening, Echo. Good evening. 23 October 1942, 8th Army. Personal message from the Army commander. When I assumed command of the 8th Army, I said that the mandate was to destroy Rommel and his army and that it would be done as soon as we are ready. We are ready now. The battle which is about to begin will be one of the decisive battles of history. It will be the turning point of the war. The eyes of the whole world will be on us, watching anxiously which way the battle will swing. We can give them their answer at once. It will swing our way. We have first-class equipment. Good tanks, good anti-tank guns, plenty of artillery and plenty of ammunition. And we are backed up by the finest air striking force in the world. All that is necessary is that each one of us, every officer and man should enter this battle with the determination to see it through, to fight and to kill and finally to win. If we all do this, there can be only one result. Together, we will hit the enemy for six right out of North Africa. The sooner we win this battle, which will be the turning point of the war, the sooner we shall all get back home to our families. Therefore, let every officer and man enter the battle with a stout heart and the determination to do his duty as long as he has breath in his body. And let no man surrender so long as he is unwounded and can fight. Let us all pray that the Lord, mighty in battle, will give us victory. B. L. Montgomery, Lieutenant General, 8th Army. And that is a note written on the eve of the Battle of Alamein, which ended up being the turning point of the war in North Africa. And General Bernard Montgomery, commonly referred to as Monty, defeated the Desert Fox, Rommel, one of the most respected generals in all of history, really. And Monty was a actually a controversial figure. And I think he got more controversial the more famous he got. He fought in World War I. He was a soldier. He was gravely wounded by a sniper in the Battle of Ypres. He was shot in the lung. He was in such bad shape that they actually dug a grave for him. But somehow he pulled through. He recovered, he served the rest of the war as a staff officer, and he was actually very critical of the, of the tactics and of the strategy and of the willingness of the leadership to accept such horrific and heinous levels of casualties. So he was critical of that. And after the war was over, he served, he stayed in the army, he served in Palestine, he served in India, and then in 1939, of course, there was more war. And he was in command of the 3rd Division. He went to France. And he was actually pretty worried about going to France. He didn't feel super confident about it. And he returned home with the rest of the British forces that were driven off the continent um, from Dunkirk. And, you know, there they were able to refit to be able to go out and re-engage and he headed to Africa next and the 8th Army was pretty beat down at that point when he showed up though he turned around their morale and made them believe that they could win and won the first major land victory of the war in the second battle of El Alamein from there he helped the invasion of Sicily and Italy and then he commanded all forces all ground forces on D-Day he commanded all the ground forces so that was obviously a massive operation he planned and led 
Operation Market Garden, which was the invasion of the Low Countries, and we've covered some of those battles on this podcast because it was not good. It didn't go well. And he was kind of the guy pushing that, but he was able to redeem himself from that during the Battle of the Bulge, which we've also covered on this podcast. So, you know, he had some ups and downs, but mostly ups. So what was the controversy or what's this kind of tainted image of him? First of all, some people saw him as being arrogant. And some of the people that saw him as being arrogant were Americans, Americans like Patton and Bradley. And I mean, let's face it, if you're talking about for sure Patton, we're not talking about a guy with a small ego. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So you can imagine that when you have a clash of egos, that can be, you know, you can get some professional jealousy and whatnot. Even Sir Winston Churchill said that Monty was, and this is a good quote, in defeat, unbeatable, in victory, unbearable. (laughs) So there's another, an anecdote about him where he was asked to name three great generals. And he said the other two would be Alexander the Great and Napoleon. Meaning he's just on top of the list. (laughs) So he may have had, he may have been a little bit egotistical. And, and, and I think from what I've read about him, he lacked, lacked tact. And later on in life, he was kind of contra- he was controversial as well. He was very critical of American tactics in Vietnam. He said that America had no clear cut objective in Vietnam, which you know, I'm critical of the tactics in Vietnam. I think it's pretty safe to say that there should have been a more clear-cut objective. That that obviously made some of our military leadership in America angry. I don't know if I would argue against those statements. He, he oddly enough, spoke positively about the Chinese Communist government when he was older. He, he publicly supported apartheid in South Africa. So these are more things that people sort of sort of tainted his image uh, but besides all that he is still known as a as a as a tactician and there's plenty of support from his troops and his men that that loved him and were ready to follow him anywhere and there are some people that say even that he acted arrogant it was almost like a show that he put on to kind of unify his troops, that they, this was Monty, this was the great guy, and we're just, we're, we got him. Look what Monty did, you know? So there's that. He wrote a lot. He spoke. He wrote well. He's got some great, some documents that he put out. And I one, one he's got a ton that he put out. One of them I'm, I'm going to read. It's a very, it's a very interesting piece. And, and so he wrote this after Germany had surrendered. And the British occupation forces were in place in Germany. So you've got the Brits there in Germany occupying the country. You've got the German civilians who have been defeated in war. And here we go to this message that he wrote. 10 June 1945, Germany. Personal message from the commander in chief to the population of the British area in Germany. You have wondered, no doubt, why our soldiers do not smile when you wave your hands or say good morning in the streets or play with the children. It is because our soldiers are obeying orders. You do not like it, nor do our soldiers. We are naturally friendly and forgiving people, but the orders were necessary and I will tell you why. In the last war of 1914, which your rulers began, your army was defeated. Your generals surrendered, and the peace treaty of Versailles, your rulers admitted that the guilt of beginning the war was Germany's. But the surrender was made in France. The war never came to your country. Your cities were not damaged like the cities of France and Belgium and your armies marched home in good order. Then your rulers began to spread the story that your armies were never really defeated, and later they denied the war guilt clauses of the peace treaty. They told you that Germany was neither guilty nor defeated. And because the war had not come to your country, many of you believed it. 
and you cheered when your rulers began another war. Again, after years of waste and slaughter and misery, your armies have been defeated. This time, the Allies were determined that you should learn your lesson, not only that you have been defeated, which you must know by now, but that you, your nation, were again guilty of beginning the war. For if that is not made clear to you and your children, you may again allow yourselves to be deceived by your rulers and led into another war. During the war, your rulers would not let you know what the world was thinking of you. Many of you seemed to think that when our soldiers arrived, you could be friends with them at once, as if nothing much had happened. But too much has happened for that. Our soldiers have seen their comrades shot down, their homes in ruins, their wives and children hungry. They have seen terrible things in many countries where your rulers took the war. For those things, you will say you are not responsible. It was your rulers. But they were done by the German nation. Every nation is responsible for its rulers. And while they were successful, you cheered and laughed. That is why our soldiers do not smile at you. This we have ordered. This we have done to save yourselves, to save your children, to save the world from another war. It will not always be so. For we are Christian forgiving people and we like to smile and be friendly. Our object is to destroy the evil of the Nazi system. It is too soon to be sure that this has been done. You are to read this to your children if they are old enough and see that they understand. Tell them why it is that the British soldier does not smile. B.L. Montgomery, Field Marshal. Commander-in-Chief, British Area. So... Obviously, that message was produced in German and in English and spread out amongst the population. I thought that was a pretty awesome outlook. And he also spoke and wrote a fair amount about leadership. And I think when you look at his writing and his speeches, you can see some of his some of his peculiarities, some of his personality shines through sometimes. And I want to take a look at some of that, some of the things that he wrote. And the first piece is called Military Leadership. And it's actually from a speech that he gave at the University of St. Andrews at 15 November 1945. It's like a transcript, or maybe it's his notes. I'm not sure which. But it's, it's written as if he was reading it. So here we go. Let's go to this book, Military Leadership. I've come here today to talk to you about military leadership. A subject such as this must in normal times seem somewhat remote from this quiet gray-walled city by the sea. Today I have to try and equate the definition of military leadership as I see it to the lessons of the past and to the experience of the present. I propose to limit myself in this talk to higher leadership, the command of armies or a group of armies, and not to consider the quality of leadership at lower levels. What I say about higher leadership may well have certain application to leadership of a brigade or a company or a section of men. There are, however, certain differences in leadership at lower levels, and I do not propose to take up your time by discussing these today. Now, you'll see as he goes into this, he covers up. He's talking about that all the time. I'm not sure even why he, he did that, but he talks about the, the, the entire chain of command throughout this speech. Military leadership is a subject which has always interested me, and during this war, I have had some opportunity to put my ideas to the test. I have found that if you aspire to lead soldiers, you must take a close study of human nature. For that is the raw material with which a commander has to achieve his end. If you neglect the human factor as a leader, you will fail. 
The personal relationship between a commander and his soldiers is and always has been one of the most potent single factors in making for success in war. If a commander has the complete confidence and trust of his men, there is nothing he cannot do. Nothing. If a commander loses the confidence of his men, he cannot succeed. That's a bold statement right there. That's a bold statement right there. And something that I talk about all the time. <laughs> and there's two, there's, a, there's two words that I use interchangeably. I should, I should use them more interchangeably more often. I talk about relationships a lot, and the word that I should use intermixed with that 50% of the time is trust. Because mm. to me, trust and relationships is kind of the same thing. Yeah, yeah. If you don't have trust, you don't have a relationship. Yeah. If you don't have a relationship, then you don't have trust. Yeah. But they do have different meanings, right? Mm. So it's important to me to establish that. And the reason that I bring that up is because if you're in a leadership position and you're breaking the trust that you have with your men, that is gonna be a real problem. Yeah. So you could say, well, you don't have a good relationship with them, but you could have not have a good relationship with someone and they could still trust you. Mm. You could not have a good relationship with someone and you hadn't broken their trust. It's gonna be hard if you break your, their trust to have a good relationship with them. Mm. But the key factor here is trust and confidence of the men. Back to the book. Now let us consider on what a man's power to lead others is based. It is necessary first to define what is meant by leadership. And this is where this gets a little interesting. I suggest to you as the definition of the word leadership, the will to dominate together with the character which, which inspires confidence. The measure of a man's ability to lead, I think, is twofold. So the first part of the definition of leadership in his mind is the will to dominate, which is, which is, which is strong. And you're gonna see where he kind of counters that and he talks about, he, he talks about decentralized command, he talks about everything that, that I believe in. But you know, I don't talk about, hey, as a leader, it's first and foremost that you have the will to dominate other humans, right? That's, <laughs> that's not, in fact, I think that's a kind of a negative quality. <laughs> but that being said, if you have someone that doesn't mind not winning, not dominating, well, then guess what? They're not gonna put forth any effort. <laughs> They're not gonna make things happen. Like force of will, I talk about that all the time. You you have to impo- you have to have the force of will to make things happen. Sometimes you just have to make things happen. Mm-hmm. They're not going to happen by themselves. Anything that's anything that's going to come that's good in life, it's not going to happen by itself. It's just not going to wake up and it's there mm-hmm. like a, like an Easter egg. That's not happening. No, yeah. no you got to go out and you got to make it happen. Yeah. Okay, maybe you get an Easter egg when you're six years old, <laughs> but sure. once you're yeah. 26 years old, there's no Easter eggs coming to you. No. You got to make them. Correct. Yeah. Back to the book. First, it lies in his will to dominate the men and events which surround him. The will to drive himself and his men to the limit of their powers for a specific purpose and the refusal to allow anything to divert him from his aim. Again, you're going to see where that sounds so strong. It sounds unbalanced, right? Yeah. It, sounds, it sounds like he's outside the dichotomy of leadership. He's going too far he's in extreme. one direction. Yeah, he's yeah. being extreme. Like nothing, you're going to refuse to allow anything to divert you. Oh, okay, so that, what does that mean? That mean you get everyone killed? That's what they did in World War I. He didn't like that. Mm. But you're going to see where he balances out these statements later. Second, it lies in the strength of his character, whether good or evil, to inspire others to place their complete trust and confidence in him and his ability to lead them with success and to enthuse his men for the task in hand. This ability of a man to inspire confidence in others and to create enthusiasm is a spiritual quality. But it is not, but it is well to remember that this quality need not necessarily be for good. The evil leader has equally the ability to inspire confidence in others. And in history, the evil leader has often, at any rate temporarily, prevailed. And he counters that at the end too. There have been many with differing, with differing types of characters, character who have inspired men to follow them. I propose to choose three great captains of the past and examine briefly why these men were leaders and how they led their men and how as leaders they succeeded or failed. So he's gonna go into a little case study, a couple pages here. 
I will first consider Moses. He was already old when he was called to lead the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. His task was an immense one. He had first to inspire his people to cast off the yoke of the Egyptians. This was no easy matter. Israel had been living for about 400 years as slaves of the Egyptians. They had lived in the Nile Delta, a bad climate and one which tends to sap up energy and initiative. But they lived where food was plenteous while all around were deserts which could barely support life. Moses must have had to overcome the most tremendous initial inertia to persuade Israel to launch out into those deserts with all the risks of famine, disease, and the necessity to fight. His power to inspire and dominate his fellow men must have been of a very high order. Now, see, that's where I just, I don't look at that as domination of your fellow man. You're, I, look, I see the inspiring part, but I'm not looking at, hey, we're looking to dominate. I, I see his angle, right? I see, I see where he's, I see where he's coming from. Mm. But and maybe that word, you know, words change, words morph, morph over time. Maybe that word dominate that he's using, maybe, maybe it had less of a sting to it mm-hmm. then, f- you know, fifty yeah. years ago, possibly had a maybe. little less sting. Mm-hmm. Seventy years, words change. Yeah, words change over time, but. That's what he's saying. But things were kind of hardcore too, right? Back then, you know, like long time ago, there just things in general were a little bit more blunt. Yeah. So maybe in the times that of Moses, factor. I'm sure they were pretty blunt. And even yeah. this time, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't know though. I, I'm not. I'm not a hundred percent sure. I'm not a hundred percent sure if he means the word dominate the way we think of it. Yeah. The way I think of it. Apparently not. I mean, it seems like there's a little bit more to it. I guess, well, when he counter, and you'll hear him counter, I guess that's what maybe makes me think maybe he means it a little bit less severe. Yeah. Maybe. Because he starts to talk about the the balance of this dichotomy. Mm-hmm. Because let's face it. Hey, okay, let me ask you this question. Here, this is going to make it real easy. Mm-hmm. If I was the type of person that was like, hey, I'm looking to dominate you, come with me into the desert where we're gonna have to live, where there's, we're getting away from the Nile River and we're going out to this barren area where there's not a lot of food and I'm gonna have a domineering personality and I'm gonna be all over you every day. H- yeah. How enticing is that? Not very enticing. Not very. Now, if I was inspiring mm-hmm. and I said, listen, Echo, we're gonna get out there, we're gonna train, we're gonna come back, we're gonna get our revenge, it's gonna take some time, but we're gonna make it, like that. that's different, right? Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, you know what, now that I'm thinking of it, it would dominate like, my, What's the root word of dominate? You know what it me? could be? Yeah, I should have studied the etymology before we got on this podcast. I apologize. You know what it could be, though? Picture when you have a good leader that dominates the room, right? Right, right, yes. That's yeah, a positive yeah. thing, yeah, right? Sorry. Oh, this guy yeah. just get you. Yeah, you know, Echo came in for the meeting. He just dominated the room. He did great. Right. That's a positive thing. Yeah. So maybe he means it that way. Unfortunately, he talks about dominating the will of, Right. He talks about dominating the men and events that surround him. Oh, no, actually, he doesn't talk about dominating the will. So maybe that's what they mean. Maybe he yeah. means just like this dominating no, presence. Right. Yeah. All right, going back to the book. Without a doubt, Moses realized that when he led Israel out of Egypt, they were useless as a fighting people. They'd been slaves for some 400 years. He therefore set to work to train them for the task and to forge the weapon which would conquer Canaan. It's interesting. He talks about the training of armies as forging weapons. Like you're forging this weapon. I think that's a pretty cool analogy. I believe that Moses intentionally kept Israel for 40 years in the desert for two generations in order to breed and train a fighting race capable of undertaking the task of conquest which lay at hand. And in that 40 years, he taught them gradually how to fight and conquer. He took meticulous care over their training. And it is most interesting to note his refusal ever to risk any failures into action. This is interesting, and he brings this up quite a bit. So Moses Moses didn't take any risk where he thought he might fail. Hmm. We read of him soon after leaving Egypt, asking if he might lead Israel through the country of another people. On being refused permission, he marches round by another way. But later, when the same situation arises, when Israel is better trained to fight, he leads his people straight through the middle of that country and destroys his enemy utterly. 
He was a good judge of what Israel was capable of doing and what Israel was not capable of doing. And as a result, he had an unbroken record of military successes. He had the wisdom and the insight into human nature to realize that the best way for a leader to gain confidence of his soldiers is to give them victories. If a commander gives his soldiers victories, they will follow him anywhere. But Moses was not permitted to see the fruits of his own work. He sinned by claiming as his own powers which did not belong to him, and for this sin of presumption, he was forced to hand over to Joshua the final conquest of Canaan, for which he had so well trained the children of Israel. So there he wraps up on, on Moses. I think, that, and he kind of refers back to this point later in the in this book, is the fact that you got to be, you know, you got to you got to push for victory, right? You got to push for victory, and this is, it's almost like risk aversion, right? Which mm. I'm not a fan of, and you can't be risk averse, mm. but you got to be calculated. Mm-hmm. Back to the book, and then the next section, he is going to talk about. Cromwell, he just refers to him as Cromwell, Oliver Cromwell, Cromwell, who was an, an English statesman, but he was a soldier. This is like in the 1600s, 1620s. He was a hardcore Puritan, and he organized military forces in the, when the Civil War broke out, 1642. He was the deputy commander of the New Model Army. He defeated the main royalist force in 1645, and then he commanded campaigns in Ireland and Scotland in the 1650s. He was he was kind of uh, over the top, I guess you might say. In some ways, he, he, I mean, beyond that, he he mass there was an Irish massacre, you know, and that spiraled into a war for hundreds of years and and ultimately as a politician once he kind of got done with the war part he became a politician and he really didn't do a great job so that's just some kind of highlights of Oliver Cromwell but here we go back to the book I next propose to consider Cromwell another leader who went to wage war only when he was over middle age He was over 40 when the Civil War broke out. He started the Civil War in command of a troop of 60 men and then commanded of that troop he fought at Edge Hill. There, in spite of the parliamentary superiority in men and guns and a fervently held cause, he saw the failure of his own side to seize the victory and and he saw them escape defeat only because of the folly of their opponents. This gave him much cause for thought superiority in men and equipment was clearly valueless unless something further was added this is the part that i kind of got fired up for what was needed also so besides guns good superiority in men superiority in equipment what was needed also was the leader who would forge the weapon out of the enthusiastic material available and would then lead it with vigor and determination determination to achieve his military end. So once again, we're talking about what leader can take this, what leader can forge a weapon from men. He saw too the nature of the weapon required and how it could be forged. So he started to understand the, the men as a weapon and how you could forge this weapon properly. And he set himself to task to the task of building a force after his own principles, based on a high fighting spirit, spirit, good discipline, and a sound knowledge of tactics. It was to be a force which would have, have complete confidence in him as their commander. So this guy saw this situation where they almost got crushed. The, the, the parliamentary forces were so disorganized that they couldn't even take advantage of it. And he saw, okay, this is my opportunity. And those are great lessons. I love it when you learn a lesson that you didn't really have to pay for. Yeah. It happens sometimes. It happens in MMA sometimes. Yes. Where you, a guy wins a fight because something you get lucky in the end and you get, oh, we got the W, but we also got to learn a great, mm-hmm. a great lesson. It happened in combat all the time. Mm-hmm. You come back off an operation, you're like, man, if we would have gotten hit at this particular moment, we had security was down, we were not paying attention, we didn't have this flank covered, 
and by the grace of God, we didn't get contacted from that area, but we can't let that happen again. So sometimes you learn a lesson even Mm -hmm. though you didn't have to pay for it, and that's what it sounds like happened here. Back to the book. He said about his task, full, we are told, of a furious zeal, a fire in his belly which compelled him, which compelled others to follow him. He had complete confidence in his ability to gain success in war. He saw the way in which he had to train his men to fight and the few essentials which would ensure success provided his men had the right fighting spirit. Edge Hill was fought in October 1642 with Cromwell as a captain of a troop of horse 60 strong. By January 1644, he was a lieutenant general, second in command of Manchester's Army of the Eastern Counties, the leading cavalry commander on the parliamentary side, and the one outstanding commander in the parliamentary army. So he made a rapid transition. Now he gets into this. Cromwell was not a likable man. He was quick-tempered, believed in rigid discipline and constant training, and he drove his men hard. But he believed with a blinding certainty in the righteousness of his cause. He enthused his soldiers with its righteousness, and he was convinced of his own ability to to achieve success in battle. This is one of those things where, you know, when you hear that people, that Monty was a little bit, like lacked tact. This is one of those things where I think, well, did he read this? You know, did he read about Cromwell and study Cromwell and say, well, look, no one liked Cromwell. Yeah, yeah. That's okay. You yeah, can yeah. still be a good leader. You don't have to be liked. Yeah. In fact, Leif will tell this story. There was a guy that was, was Leif was teaching a, a class to young SEALs and there was a SEAL officer that would come in and say, you shouldn't be liked if you're in charge. Yeah. <laughs> And Leif, you know, would sit in the back of the room and think to himself, geez, this is not good because that's not true. Yeah. That's not true. Mm-hmm. Now, it's probably true that what the guy was trying to say is, listen, you're not always going to be popular for you. Know, your goal should not be to be liked, yeah. which I agree with. Yeah. But to say, look, you're going to be hated by your troops. That's just the way it is. And that's wrong. If you're yeah. hated by your troops, you're probably doing something wrong. Yeah. Yeah. And to say that. If you're essentially the what the guy that Leif is talking about, if he's saying if you're liked by your troops, you're doing something wrong, kind of thing. Yeah, that's true too. It's what it feels like, you know. Yeah. So, so I understand that thought as well. Like, hey, everyone loves me. I must be doing a good job. It's like, no, actually, if everyone just thinks you're their buddy, that's a problem. So, that this this may have been what this officer was trying to teach to the uh, to the young officers that that Leif was in charge of instructing. Yeah. I'm sure he tried to was trying to say the right thing, yeah. but perhaps he wasn't articulating it a hundred percent in the most clear way. Mm-hmm. Where the guy, because just to tell, hey, you're not going to be liked where you're an officer. Yeah. Mm, not true. Yeah. Not true. A- and not good. If I have, if I look at a SEAL platoon and the SEAL platoon doesn't like their officer, that's not a positive sign. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that does not mean sense. that guy's a good leader. Yeah. Now, it's also not a good sign if oh the SEAL platoon everyone loves him. That doesn't mean that's a good good platoon either. Yeah. So you can be loved, but you're not doing a good job. You can be hated, and you can be doing a good job, but you're probably not going to be able to pull off doing a good job. When guys don't like you, they're not going to put forth any real effort to yeah. to make you look good is basically what they're doing. Yeah, yeah. and at the end of the day, it obviously seems like it's just not that cut and dry. You know, no, it's no, like no. The, you know. no. Back to the book. And he did achieve success. He had no failures. And if a commander has a righteous cause and gives his soldiers success, he will gain the complete confidence of his men, and then there is nothing he cannot do. But the power which his prowess in the field had won for him led Cromwell to seize the reins of government for himself. He became impatient with the inefficiency methods, inefficiency of the parliamentary government of those days, and he compared it unfavorably with his own ability as a soldier to give immediate decision and to see it take shape at once in action. So he took over the government and he wanted things to move real quick. But unfortunately, but as in battle, he had been sure of the correct course of action, so in the political field, he was on many occasions uncertain and perplexed. During the period in which he ruled England, he tried out five different systems of government and all failed. 
And at the end, he was governing alone and much more absolutely than ever Charles had attempted to rule. Internally, he taxed the people more highly and he disregarded parliament more brazenly than Charles had ever done. And he interfered with the personal liberty more tyrannously. In Ireland also, his harsh and cruel policy left a lasting hatred which the centuries have not quenched. But his rule was not wholly unproductive. He made the fighting service. So he did accomplish one thing. He made the fighting services the finest in the world. And he gained for England a voice in the affairs of Europe such as England had never had before. So he was not a good governmental leader. Many of his triumphs abroad were transient and and unsubstantial. And much that he attempted at home disappeared when he died. But his work for the Navy and its initial steps toward the creation of an empire planted a foundation from which much has grown. So he had a good impact on the military, but his governmental his governmental leading abilities weren't all that strong. The third great captain I suppose to I propose to consider is Napoleon, a leader driven by selfish and evil ambition. That's interesting. And not like the other two, in pursuit of a great ideal. Unlike the other two, he was a soldier by profession. Trained from his youth in the profession of arms, even as a very young boy in a military academy, he was clearly a leader. He wished to dominate, and he did dominate his fellow men. (laughs) There it is. That one sounds a little stronger. That sounds a little (laughs) bit more like what I think of dominate. Again... Unlike the other two, he rose at a very early age to a high and independent command. At the age of 26, he took command of the Army of Italy and army inferior numbers and equipment to its opponents and semi-mutinous from lack of pay. Yet, within a year, with this inferior weapon, which he reforged to his liking, he fought brilliantly a brilliantly successful campaign in northern Italy and imposed peace on his enemy. I like that. Imposed peace on his enemies. <laughs> From the moment of his arrival with his army, he dominated his troops, both generals and soldiers, and inspired them with confidence in his ability to give them success. Of that ability, he himself had never any doubt. And in his own self-confidence lay much of his power to inspire confidence in others. Behind this dominating self-confidence, however, lay Napoleon's ability to see in any military problem the few essentials on which success would depend. He had the great power to simplify any problem and to see what details were important and which were unimportant. There you go. That's prioritize and execute, and it's simple, both in one big rule, mm. right? Mm-hmm. You gotta know what's important, you gotta prioritize the important things, and you gotta keep everything simple. I got a, I got an email from Sarah Armstrong. Sure. <sighs> Talking about podcast 174, trying to be a 5-0. Mm-hmm. Trying to be a 5-0 in all categories. Mm-hmm. And she basically emailed me and said, hey, heads up. I used to try and be a 5 in every category, mm-hmm. even in categories that didn't matter. Mm-hmm. So that's, you know, give people a heads up. And I was like, well, yeah, I mean, I've talked about, I've talked about that. I talk about it with clients all the time, but I talk about it on the podcast as well. When the, specifically, I talked about it saying, I don't know if you remember this example, I said a black belt in jujitsu, mm-hmm. like they don't care when you're grabbing their sleeve and you're getting all crazy, they don't care. That mm-hmm. doesn't matter. Yeah. If you're a white belt, someone grabs your sleeve, you're freaking out. Yep. But if you're if you're a black belt, it's like okay. If you're a good leader and there's some 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 issue that guys are complaining about, it's no factor. You don't care. Mm-hmm. And then there's some issues that come up and you go, okay, that's important. I need to address that. Yeah. So this is what he had the ability to do: is figure what is essential and what is not. Yeah. Yeah, and that's that can be kind of a tricky one because you know some some things are super small. Super small, but at the end of the day, they might be kind of important. Yes. You know, like you can sort of predict. You're like, hey, that's small. Sure. For but, sure. But, hey, I could see that like continuing and growing, you know. For sure. Something and like sometimes that. sometimes all you have to do is monitor it to yeah. make sure it doesn't grow. Yeah. Sometimes you have to put it in check, for sure. Sometimes you have yeah. to destroy something, yeah. remove it, yeah. kill it. Yeah. 
sometimes you can't worry about it because it's not important. Yeah. So you gotta figure which one of those out. Like if your employee, say you're a boss, your employee comes in one minute late. Let's say he comes in on time every single time, mm-hmm. like, but right on, he has to get there at six. He yep. gets there at six on the dot every single day. Yep. And then like one week on Monday, he comes in at 6.01. Mm-hmm. Is that a big problem? One day? No, it's not a problem. You you might want to throw a little something at him. Right, it's just something. A little something? It's not nothing, yeah. Just so a little something. That's right. Like, you know, you might even want to say something like along this. It's probably what I'd say. Mm-hmm. Uh, see what happens when you cut it so close every day. You're already a little, you, you missed it by a minute, bro. Exactly. Right? right. That's Just yep. throw a little, a little. Yeah. Just let them know you're watching. Yeah. Just like I said, like some things they're teeny, but, but they're am worth I gonna monitoring. But am I going to give a dude a written counseling because they were one minute late? No. Right. Because now the guy's looking for a different job somewhere because he doesn't want to work for me. Yeah, yeah. You spaz out yeah. on him. <laughs> but at the same time, he's at 601. He's like, cool. 604. Next day he comes in at 6 o'clock, we'll say next day. Then the next Monday he comes in at 602. Oh, two now. It's just one more minute, right? Got to put it in check. Yes, sir. You just do. a little something. Saying like some things they seem small, but you, you take a broader view well, and you're like, hey, it's kind of important. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is, goes back to the troop shaving in the Soviet troops stopping shaving. This is it. This is the yeah. slippery slope of a lack slippery of discipline. Slippery slope. Yeah. But I can tell you this if you're focused only on these little things, you might miss the big picture, which was Sarah's point. Yes. And I responded and I said, hey, d- I. Totally agreed with her, talked about some of the, the black belt thing and then the boss thing. And then I was like, and by the way, because this is something I've talked about, the floor in my garage gym yeah. is not clean. Yeah. It uh, it gets a 2.0 on cleanliness. Out of what? Five? Out of five. Okay. Maybe even gets a one. I think one, man. Yeah, maybe gets a one. Because 2.0 no, is no, not no. bad. However, however. It gets like a 1.5 because it's not it's it's not it doesn't have actual dirt on it right it's, it's just, just got it's span. just got uh chalk and sweat stains yeah dried up utility yeah not, not just, neglect just but used. you know yeah yeah and i said it would take 20 minutes to a half an hour each day to keep that thing at a 5.0 inspection ready level because yeah. what you got to get in there is basically you got to power wash that thing daily that's yeah. where you're at yeah so I'm not power washing that thing daily. Nope. Why don't it? Why is it? Why is it not clean? Not important. Yeah. Do I have? I actually have a vacuum in my garage that I <laughs> hit it with. Sometimes sure, I hit it every two, three days. Yeah. That's a lot different than breaking out than than pulling the mats out, power washing them in the alley, yeah. and then bringing them back in. That's a that's not even a half an hour. That's like a that's a serious evolution. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a serious evolution. Yeah. So is it worth being a 5.0 in Matt cleanliness garage gym? The answer is no. Mm-hmm. The answer is no. It's not worth it. Yeah. You need to lower that on the priority scale. Now, do I have big chunks of dirt and and dog hair piled up and debris? No. Mm-hmm. It's completely debris free. Yep. But there are some sweat stains on it. There yeah. has been some, there's there are the remnants of getting after it. Sure, <laughs> right, which is kind of conducive. Which can is be the way it is. Yeah. The way so it is. what's the standard then, generally speaking? Not just in application to your garage, gym, floor, to like everything. It's like little things. I mean, just a basic little little framework to establish. It depends on the thing. Yeah. So, but what is it? so you can go so you go fundamentally then. So what is it like if it. If it gets in the way, even if this much, even if this little millimeter gets in the way of the overall objective, then it's relevant, important? Well, no. Then we just have to frame it so that we're not, we, we, we frame it as a waste of time. Like how much effort are you going to put into that? that right. Has no. If it's not, if it doesn't get in the way. If it, no, no. If it gets in the way, then I'm putting too much time. If, if it gets in the way of my strategic goal, yeah. Uh, it's too, I'm putting too much time into it. Oh, okay. If solving this particular yeah. problem gets yeah. away, yes, yes. Okay, yeah. okay. But uh, I meant the existing of a small little problem. If it's if it's get gets in the way, so like that Yo, guy if it gets in like the a, way, then it's a problem. Right. Then I got hundred percent. Yeah. So if it does, like um, like the guy coming in late, right? Let's say on my garage floor there was chunks of rocks underneath the mats. Yeah. And they made it uneven. Yeah. And it was 
like slightly hazardous right. for me to be moving around on it and it interrupted and my weights rolled around. That'd be a problem. Yes. It's it's affecting my strategic goal. Yes. Those mats are getting picked up, the rocks are getting moved, the floor is getting leveled and we're good to go. Yeah. On the on the levelness, my mats get a 50. Yeah. They're perfectly flat. Yeah. They're good to go. Yes, sir. They do not interfere at all. But they got some getting after it stains on them. Yep, there it is. <laughs> Boom. Okay, going back to the book, having grasped the essentials of the problem and having inspired his soldiers with confidence in himself and with high morale, he knew he could not fail. Napoleon, however, was always as much a politician as a soldier. He had a great love of intrigue and of diplomatic bargaining and his contempt for his fellow men and his passion to dominate them and events led him to aspire to greater things. From the time he became first consul, political rather than military factors influenced his decisions and his failure to reconcile his political aspirations with what was militarily possible finally led him to the disasters of Moscow and the peninsula from which no recovery was possible. He started playing that political game started making his de military decisions based on what he wanted to happen politically. Now, what did these three men, Moses, Cromwell, and Napoleon have in common without which they would have not achieved success? The most outstanding similarity was that they dominated their fellow men. They were all supremely confident that they could and would do what they set out to do. It was quite simple to them, quite easy, and success was absolutely certain. This certainty gave them each the power to inspire others to follow blindly and to the limit of their strength, and this inspiration and power to enthuse others immeasurably increased the power of their forces to achieve whatever was asked them. That's called confidence right there. That's what that is, pure confidence. Isn't it, isn't it interesting when you see someone that's ultra confident? And yeah, like not no, they're not even overflowing into ego, but they're just really, really confident, yeah. and and pe people follow. Them. Yeah. People will will be like, okay, I'm on board. This 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 person's in the game. They believe it. I'm, I'm believe I believe it too. Yeah, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. I've seen situations where people are so confident that people are following them, even though they're wrong. Hmm. You know, you get you you get that occasionally with a with a seal platoon. You get some experienced guy that was super confident. And he w actually wasn't that good or didn't really understand tactics too well. And he's, no, this is what we're doing. Yeah, you know, so I've done this a million times. That's, that's all. By the way, that's a red flag. <laughs> what, uh, yeah. okay. when, somebody, when somebody counts on their number of times or their experience, mm -hmm. that's the way we've always done it. I've done this a million times. That's a red flag. <laughs> the reason that they're using those statements is because they don't have an actual answer. So when one of the new guys says, hey, hey, boss, I'm, I'm not really sure why we why are we assaulting, you know, through the target from this area over here wouldn't it make more sense to do and he goes oh look i've done this a million times this is how we're doing it yeah, you yeah, just think yourself just oh. so you don't have an actual answer yeah. you don't have an answer as to why you're just you're just throwing that out there yeah. that's the easiest thing for you to do so if you ever find yourself saying because this is how we've always done it or look i've been doing this for 28 years yeah yeah and you don't i have know a better. I, no you know that's you don't have a good answer <laughs> <laughs> you're wrong that could work against you, to be honest with you. Yeah, I've been doing this for 28 years, and then like oh. that day, the person figures out like a way better way of doing it. You're like, dang, bro, you've been wasting your time for 28 years <laughs> yeah. doing that? Yeah, it could definitely work out bad. It could work out bad because you're not listening to anyone else, you're not taking input, mm -hmm. and then you end up making a bad decision. From what did these men get their supreme confidence in their ability to achieve their purpose in battle? I think they got it from their ability to see their problem in its simplest form. Amen. Oh, I totally agree with that. To see the few essentials necessary to the successful solution of the problem and to see how those few essentials could be achieved. This is why. So I, I, I'm always talking about qualities of leadership, the ability to simplify. I'm mm -hmm. sure you've heard me say this a thousand times. Mm hmm if you have the ability to simplify things, that's a great asset to have and not everyone has it or not everyone has the same level of it. Some people are good at it, some people not so much. Yeah. Some people just straight up complicate things. Oh yeah. <laughs> 
Once they grasped the essentials of the problem, they never lost sight of them and never allowed a massive detail to submerge what was essential to success. Boom, don't get caught up in the little details of things. Don't let those things drown out what the real situation is. For all military problems are in essence simple, but the ability to simplify and to select out of the massive detail those things and only those things that are important is not always so easy. So, gotta keep things simple. Each of these men had the power to dominate other men's spirits, to inspire their enthusiasm, and to convince them of their own ability to achieve what was asked of them. This moving of men's spirits, this power to enthuse, could only be done and was only done by their personal contact with their men. All my three examples were in close and frequent contact with their troops. They were well known, familiarly known to them and took frequent opportunities of talking to their men. So again, this is where that the thing I, I, I spoke of earlier, where it's like he kind of he, he kind of comes back on, hey, you got to be this dominating person. But he's talking about you got to get out there and talk to your troops. You got to be really truly personally known to them. Napoleon and Cromwell certainly, and very possibly Moses too, were known to their men by nicknames and used this familiarity to help their purpose. At the same time, each of these leaders knew well what the soldier was thinking and what he wanted most, and they made always careful study of the human factor. Now, it's interesting because, you know, Monty, he's known as Monty. Everybody called him Monty. Yeah. And that's his nickname. Yeah. And that little breeds a little familiarity. Yeah. And, like, I stole naming a unit renaming a unit when you took it over. I stole that from David Hackworth. Yeah. I wonder if Crom. I, mean, I wonder if Monty stole this nickname idea and kind mm-hmm. of gave himself that nickname. Right. I wonder if Hackworth took it from Monty. Well, no, Hackworth. Well, actually, I guess Hackworth. Everyone just called Hack Hack. Hey, everyone called me Jocko. Yeah. Like everyone. Yeah. It's funny. Someone said, everyone in the chain of command. The the people below me in the chain of command called me Jocko, and the people above me in the chain of command called me Jocko. Everyone called me Jocko. Yeah. So that, that was kind of cool, but it was just like coincidence. I don't even know why. Yeah. But Hackworth, he didn't really, I don't think Hackworth gave himself a nickname. Yeah. And let's face sense. it, Hackworth, other than Hackworth, and as, as General Mukayama told us, he had the best nickname of all time. Mr. Infantry. (laughs) (laughs) That is the coolest nickname ever. Is hack considered a nickname? I think so. If it's short for your... I think it is, yeah. 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 Because there are certain names that have an official shortening of it, you know, like Richard and Rick or, you know, Jonathan and John. Robert and Bob. Bob, yes, exactly. Bill and William and Bill and that. Okay. So... But hack is not an official. Right, it's unofficial, so it's sort of, it, it goes into the realm of actual nickname. Yeah. Not just shortening of the name. Yeah. Yeah. That's the. But I, I think I, we, we can research this. I'll, it's not coming to me off the top of my head, but I'm pretty sure everyone called Hack Hack. Yeah. Like up and down the chain of command. Yeah. Although his soldiers back in the day probably called him Sir. That's more normal for Vietnam. Dang. How do you engineer a nickname, though, for yourself? No, you can't do that. that well, you can't work. give your nickname to yourself. Mm-hmm. No, but you can. I'm sure there has to be a way to sort of engineer the environment. Well, you could say, hey, you I'm know? Hack. How's it going? Right? Yeah, but that isn't that, I mean, if it, it would have to be established before that. If you just start, like, if I just start saying, hey, I'm Dragon. No, if you, if you checked into a military unit or you, you, and no one knew you, and you're like, hey, what's up? I'm, I'm, I'm Dragon Boy. Yeah, but. <laughs> that but, would be, no, that wouldn't work. No, because. But if you said, hey, my, my name is, you know, Frag Mob or whatever. <laughs> If you just made up, you know, your sure. nickname, all oh, guys call me that. Yeah, one, one time I hooked a grenade and it, and it rolled back and. You know, yeah, but there's a place what where if that's from. not true, though? You well, know, like that would mean if look, if you hooked a grenade in a thing and someone called you Frag Mob from then then on, then boom, someone gave you that nickname. Yeah. But you can't hook a grenade; it does whatever it is that uh-huh. it does, and be like, you know what? I should be called. <laughs> you know, you can't really do that. No, you you're not allowed that. to nickname yourself. No. So even if you introduce yourself, if no one knows you, introduce yourself. Okay, I'm Dragon Boy, but I just gave that name to myself today, and 
But and they find sure they'll call you Dragon Boy. Yeah. But if one person finds out, oh, you just gave yourself that nickname. Oh yeah, like you, they're, they're gonna they're give gonna you a different like, nickname. Bro, oh yeah. yeah oh, quick. you're somebody else. Yes, yeah, sir. Real. So quick. how do you do it though? How no, do you, you don't. You don't. You just gotta let it. That's let what I think it. is important. What's important here is that the familiarity isn't a lie. The familiarity is real. Yes. That's the difference. I know how you do it. How? It's not ju- it's not hundred percent you. It's more allowing nicknames to be. Seen. You know how like you know how some people their name. I don't know for just for example, um, hypothetical example. Like let's say it's like, hey, my name's um, Jonathan. Mm-hmm. And then you know in a casual conversation, like, hey John, what's up John? And then they'll be like, hey, it's like a, no disrespect or nothing, but it's Jonathan. Like oh, they yeah, prefer yeah. the whole yeah. thing. Um, maybe well, John's more of an official one. But like if Hackworth would have said, hey, it's it's Hackworth. Yeah. It's not Hack. Then he probably wouldn't have had the name Hack. That's true. So when someone busts out a nickname for you, you just gotta let it fly. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, in the teams, when they bust out a nickname for you, if you protest it, it's gonna stick even. <laughs> there you go. Even more. <laughs> <laughs> so you could essentially, in theory, fake protest. actively protest. Exactly yeah. right. And, and but we'll, they'd we'll, see right through that. I know, right? You gotta do like, it all. Oh, you like it called that? Fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're gonna give you a different nickname yeah. now. Uh, uh, yeah. Jagass. <laughs> you gotta be quick. You gotta be sneaky with it. I guess. All right. Okay, back to the book. If a leader neglects the human factor, he will fail. No man can lead others if he does not know what they are thinking and feeling. So, again, we got Monty here who kind of talks like he's all aloof and everything, but he knows you got to know your people Mm. and you got to understand people. And then he goes on a little shift here. No leader, however great, can, can, can long continue unless he wins victories. Without victories in battle, all else is useless. To what then is success in battle due? In his great study of Marlboro, Mr. Winston Churchill says very truly, and so here's a little quote from Winston Churchill, and this is interesting. He's talking about the Duke of Marlborough who was uh, an, a, another guy in the 1600s that fought in the war of Spanish succession. This guy never lost a battle, apparently. And, and interesting, he was the Duke of Marlborough, but his actual name was John Churchill. And he is actually, I wanna say the great, great, maybe great grandfather of Winston Churchill. So this is Winston Churchill's bloodline. Sure. And this is what Winston Churchill says about his great, great, however many great grandfathers. And I think that's right. The success of a commander does not arise from following rules or models. It doesn't come from following rules or models. It consists in an absolutely new comprehension of the dominant facts of the situation at a time and all the forces at work. Every great operation of war is unique. What is wanted is a profound appreciation of the actual event. There is no surer road to disaster than to imitate imitate the plans of bygone heroes and to fit them to novel situations. So there you go. This ability to to absolutely comprehend this new situation mm. and to not try and force, not try and force a, a rule or a model to, to work for you in a certain situation. Back to the book. This indeed is true. For in no war, for in war, no two situations are ever the same and each situation must be tackled as a wholly new problem to which there will likely be a wholly new answer. You need only to look at the beginning of this war and to, and to the trust put in the Maginot line. Here indeed was there a failure to appreciate the new and changed technique which had risen and one which rendered such fortifications in themselves wholly useless. To win victories, certain qualities are necessary and I will mention four which were possessed in greater or less by all the great captains of history. These are the knowledge of the technique of making war. So that's interesting because Churchill just said, look, it's not using this previous knowledge. You gotta be able to apply it. But at the same time, guess what? You gotta have the knowledge of the technique of making war. Next, the ability to see clearly the few essentials that are important to success. Next, courage and mental robustness. And lastly, a well-balanced judgment. He kind of goes through these in a little bit more detail now. 
The manner in which war is waged varies from age to age and with the advent of each new weapon. It is a constantly changing, constantly evolving thing. He who aspires to high command in war must thoroughly understand the main principles which will dictate the manner in which the battle of of his age will be fought. He also must be constantly on the watch for new ideas or weapons which will affect those principles. The speed of change in military science during time of peace is often slow and many have consequently allowed themselves to be lulled into false sense of security, which has been rudely shattered on the outbreak of war. So guess what? You gotta have an open mind. And you gotta pay attention. The knowledge of how to make war also implies the ability to train troops. Every great commander has himself had to forge his weapon for the task in front of him. Moses led the people of Israel for 40 years in the desert, teaching them how to fight, and he forged the weapon to conquer Canaan. So also Cromwell and Napoleon, they forged their own weapon for the specific task in hand, improvising and inventing as they went along so as to develop new tactics to deal with the new problems with which in their day they were faced. So got to study war you've got to understand how to train your troops continuing on no man can be a great military leader unless he has the ability to cut through overlying difficulties and to see clearly the few essentials in any problem which with which he is faced in any problem there are never more than a few essentials which are vital to that problem that's a pretty bold statement Mm -hmm. and it's also pretty true yeah you get these big problems, guess what? There's only a few things that are truly essential. Now, as you solve the first couple essential ones, there's gonna be the next essential problem. This is prioritize and execute. Yeah, and it's kind of simple too, right? And like simple, how you're yes, saying like, like they're both wrapped together yeah. in this thought. These must be grasped out of the mass of details and must never be lost sight of. If in battle a commander loses sight of the few essentials that matter, he will suffer defeat. So when you're getting distracted by these other things, you're gonna end up losing. Mm -hmm. But to see the essentials clearly, he must not himself get too immersed in detail. Every great commander has had a chief of staff whose main task was the mastery of detail, thus leaving his master free to tackle essentials of the problem together with those details and only those, those details which were vital to that problem. Boom. That's it. You cannot get in the weeds. You cannot micromanage. You cannot look at a plan all day and expect that you're going to see something that your troops didn't see who were doing the planning. You need to step back. You need to elevate yourself. For though there is much detail in which the, for though there is much detail with which a commander cannot and must not bother himself, it is interesting to note that every great commander has always concerned himself with certain of the details of his problems. Napoleon and Wellington are two good cases in point. No man can rise to a high command who has not the quality of courage. The highest form of personal courage is required rather in the leader at the lower level who has to plunge into the turmoil of the battlefield. So yeah, if you're in the frontline troops, you need even more courage. The leader at the higher levels has to develop his quality of courage into a mental robustness which can withstand the mental stress and strain with which he will be assailed. He must at all times, he must be able at all times to take a dispassionate view of the good and bad fortune which will assail him. (sighs) Read that one again. He must be able at all times to take a dispassionate view of the good and bad fortune which will assail him. So look, okay, bad things are going to happen. Good things are going to happen. Don't get all excited when some. You don't get all excited. You got to be dispassionate. You got to mm. detach. Mm. You can't let your emotions start getting crazy. You have to detach. He must not allow himself to be distracted by events or to be led astray from his main purpose by some glittering prize. He must at all times maintain an unbiased view of the situation, and in battle he must be able to judge the true value of the mass of good and bad tidings which will flow upon him. Man, 
Stay detached. Stay level headed. Good or bad. Is that kind of like when, like, you know, how you get the the husband or the boyfriend or whatever that, like, you know, does something bad? I don't know. Flirts with a girl or Mm -hmm. something like that. Girl, the girlfriend's all mad. Mm -hmm. And then, so the guy goes and buys her, like, a necklace, Mm -hmm. you know, to say sorry. It's kind of like that, right? Where don't get all caught up in the glittery stuff because, you know. No, that's not what this is like. (laughs) (laughs) This is like this. Echo's saving up to buy a house. Yeah. And and he's saving up and he's like, Okay, I saved, you know, eight hundred bucks last month, I'm gonna save twelve hundred bucks this month, I'm gonna save nine hundred bucks this month, and all of a sudden you see a, a new car. With rims. And and with has rims. <laughs> sure. And you can get it, you can lease it. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. And all you need to lease it is you know, four thousand dollars. Yeah. And you're like, you know what? I'm gonna go get that. <laughs> That's the shiny new thing. They right. just took you off your main goal. Yeah, yes. So this has nothing to do with flirting girlfriends well, and buying necklaces, you know. bro. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think yours is a better example for sure. I think yeah. so. Yours wasn't <laughs> yep. even an example. You missed the point. <laughs> okay. There yeah. You go. Uh, I'm trying to think of where it would be. Oh, yeah. I mean, so if you're going to talk like a girl that was saving for a house. Yeah. And then she saw a cool necklace. That would have been a good example. Yeah, okay. But the flirting girl with the distraction from the boyfriend? No, that's that's a whole well, different situation. Well, I mean, here's how I would try to connect the dots on that one. Oh, where man, you know, the girl's like, "Hey, shut. her mission is to evaluate whether or not this is a good boyfriend." Straight mm-hmm. up. And then, so the boyfriend he does some stuff that's fundamentally bad. Cheats on her. I don't know. Whatever. Mm-hmm. And and then you know, so she's sort of on that mission. She's sort of making the evaluation. Then boom, she gets distracted by the sparkly necklace. Boom, she goes back to him. Blah blah blah. See what I'm saying? <laughs> No. Still no, bad. Oh, not, okay. not quite. Right. Not quite, bro. Tr- I mean, a good, good effort. <laughs> good effort. Uh, moving on. Every battle resolves itself into a tussle between the wills of t- the two opposing commanders. Unless he is mentally robust, a commander will not be able to force his will on his opponent. It is well for a commander to remember that no battle was ever lost until the commander thought it so. Hmm. No battle was ever lost until the commander thought it so. A commander must have a well-balanced judgment. I'm getting to a little balance of the dichotomies here. Both on the battle situation and in his dealings with his subordinates. This is straight up dichotomy of leadership. He must see, okay, now he must see the battle situation as constantly shifting interplay of forces and he must instinctively know when to be rash and when to be cautious. Boom. Gotta be balanced. Mm-hmm. He must weigh up the situation both at the moment and as it may develop in the future, and he must so fight his battle that the enemy's reactions cannot ex- upset his plan. And although he is trying to force his will on his opponent, a commander must know when discretion is the better part of valor. His desire to dominate his opponent must not outweigh his judgment of the actual possibilities of the situation. Yes, you got to be aggressive, but you can't be foolhardy. That's what we're saying here. This is the dichotomy of leadership. His judgment must always be well balanced. And if it is so, and if he has good information on which to base it, he can so force the battle his way that the enemy will be forced to conform. He will in fact, have wrested the initiative from the enemy. In his dealings with his subordinates, he will also require good judgment and sound knowledge of human nature. He must choose his subordinates well. Those with whom he is in frequent contact, his senior generals must know personally, he must know personally and well. He must be able to judge when to drive and when to persuade, when to be stern and when to give praise. For all men are different and each requires handling in a different way. So right there, he just talked about the dichotomy leadership, right? When to drive and when to persuade. When to be stern, when to give praise. Got to balance those dichotomies. The three leaders whom I have concerned, considered succeeded so long as they kept in their mind their clear military purpose and were not deflected from it by any other considerations. But there is always the danger that other and especially political considerations will be forced, will force the hand of the soldier and lead him to some action which is militarily unwise. 
Many battles have been fought for political and not for military reasons, and these have been the graveyard of many a soldier's reputation. The soldier is the servant of the statesman and is therefore bound to be subject to political pressure. He must be strong enough to resist such pressure whenever it conflicts with his clear military purpose. Few statesmen will force the hand of the soldier if the soldier very bluntly says, if I fight as you wish me to fight, I shall lose the battle. If I fight in my own way and in my own time, I shall win the battle. So there you go. That's what you got to do. You got to call it like you see it. But the soldier must be prepared to be very blunt and he must be prepared to stake his whole reputation on success if given adequate resources and a free hand. And he also must be prepared to be very firm and to refuse to be forced to do something which he considers is not capable of being done. So there you have it. If you don't think something can be done, it's your moral obligation to say no. Mm. And of course, you have to weigh that with the fact that if you don't do it, someone else might, and they might cause even more damage. Mm. So you have to weigh that, that conundrum. Back to the book. In history, the military leader has frequently been tempted and has frequently succumbed to the temptation to aspire to political leadership. The whole training and experience of the soldier makes him less rather than more fitted to be a politician. So this is, this is an interesting contrast. The soldier is trained to take direct action down certain well-defined lines and has in his hand a military machine which responds immediately and with precision to his touch. The politician is trained in subtlety, in debate, in weighing up the conflicting interests of his supporters and usually has to compromise. The governmental machine is much less precise and exact than the military and is not as rapid in action even in highly skilled political hands. Now, in war, if commander compromises on essentials, he fails. Furthermore, the time factor forces the commander in the field to adopt the best expedient in the time available, which is usually short. The politician, on the other hand, is seldom forced to give an immediate decision. Rather, he delays in order to find out the right and accurate answer, and he avoids any temporary expedient. One seizes time by the forelock and adopts the best expedient. The other procrastinates in order to ensure that what he does is exactly right. Now, I think you could, I think this gets taken to the extreme in both cases because you actually, even as a military leader, you want to weigh and make sure you're you want to you want to wait long enough to make sure you're making a good decision. And I think in the political world, they go to the extreme of they're just going to never make a decision, never mm-hmm. going to make a change. Mm-hmm. Therefore, a leader who is primarily a soldier, when he meddles with politics, loses his clear and simple military purpose. He no longer sees the essentials. He is at sea in a political world. We read that Cromwell in politics was muddled and perplexed, working slowly and deviously to a policy which he did not clearly see. And again, that he was confused and distracted. So though he kept the political power in his own hands during his lifetime, much of what he built fell to pieces the moment he died. So also Napoleon. As long as his military purpose was uppermost in his mind, he succeeded. But when political considerations dominated his policy, the desire to impose his will on Europe led him to undertake military operations, which it was beyond his power to achieve. The qualities required by a soldier and by a politician are, in fact, almost at opposite poles. And only a few men in history have possessed both kinds of qualities. There have not been many soldiers who have made good politicians, nor many politicians who have made great soldiers. Now, the only thing I'll say is that being in the military is very political. And you, even in this time, I'm not going to make any distinction that, oh, it's more political now. It's not. The old old books about World War II, there's all kinds of politi- politics, politics going on inside the chain of command. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm not sure why he, I'm not sure why he, he sees that great distinction between, you know, there being no, like there's no p- political things, no political games being played in the military. There certainly is. Certainly is. And there always has been. Mm-hmm. 
mm-hmm. there always will be. It's a group of people. Mm-hmm. And a group of people are going to do their little political maneuvers. Mm-hmm. They're going to look out for themselves. They're going to try and make this happen. You know, that's, that's, they're going to have an agenda. Mm-hmm. You got to learn how to negotiate those politics, whether you're in the military or whether you're in the civilian sector. It doesn't matter. Before we leave the past, it is, I think, interesting to note that great military leaders have, on the whole, been few. There have been many generals of good average ability, but few who were really great. In the study of those who were great, it is interesting to note two things. First, it required a war to produce them. Second, that a number of them proved their greatness after a very short apprenticeship. This suggests that the art of war at any rate in the past, though less so now, is a relatively simple art. And that the qualities which make a great commander are inherent rather than acquired. Interesting, he's a little bit more saying, hey, you're kind of born with it. Mm. The character and more especially the will to dominate and lead his fellow men is given to few. But given that power to lead, the ability to gain success in war can be acquired, so you can get better at it. Mm -hmm. A man may cultivate the qualities of a great leader provided that he has inherent in him in sufficient degree the character and the will to dominate. (laughs) But unless he has those inherent characteristics, he will never become a great leader however long he studies the art or the craft of war. It is one of the phenomena of military history that events invariably produce the man. Age has little or nothing to do with it. The opportunity may come sooner to some, later to others. Napoleon was 27 when he conquered northern Italy. Wolfe was 34 when he captured Quebec. At the other end end of the scale, Marlborough was 52 when he first rose to a high and independent command. And Abercrombie conducted a short but brilliant campaign in Egypt at the age of 68, at the end of a long lifetime. In the careers of great generals, there has always been this aspect of chance. Opportunity comes at different ages and in different circumstances. Some have been luckier than others. Some perhaps never had the opportunity to prove their ability. So that's where he wraps up so much for the lessons of history. Today, the problems of military leadership are much the same as they always have been. I propose to tell you now some of the things that have guided me in leading armies which have been entrusted to my command. I would say first that a leader must very clearly know what he wants himself. He must see his objective clearly and must go all out for it. He must let everyone else know what he wants and what are the basic fundamentals of his policy. He must in fact give firm guidance and a clear lead. It will be necessary for him to create what I call atmosphere. And in that atmosphere, his subordinate commanders and troops will live and work. To do this, he will have to take a very firm grip on his military machine from the top. Only in this way will his force acquire balance and cohesion and so develop its full fighting potential. History has many examples of a lack of grip being taken by a commander with the result that he failed to develop the power of which his force was capable and so met disaster. So we've got, this is Monty, you gotta take that firm grip. Mm -hmm. And again, it's very strange because he comes off so strong like that, but Here we go, he's gonna counter it right here. Having laid down the basic fundamentals of his policy, a commander must must place complete trust in his subordinates and must give them freedom to carry out that policy within the framework which he has laid down. So this is decentralized command. He must be prepared to decentralize and to trust his subordinates to use their own initiative on all matters of detail. Everyone listen to that. Don't worry about the details. The commander himself must stand back from the detail so he can see clearly the essentials of his problem and make sure that the correct action is being taken on those essentials. If ever a commander allows himself to become too greatly immersed in the unimportant details of any problem, he will fail to see the essentials clearly. Detach, take a step back, elevate yourself. It is obvious that he must be a good judge of men and a good chooser of subordinates. He must also have the drive to get things done. 
No commander will long remain in the first rank unless he achieves success. The biggest single factor for making success in war is morale. A high morale is based on discipline, self-respect, and the confidence of the soldier in his commanders and in his weapons. It is a pearl of very great price, and without it, no success in battle will be achieved. A high morale is, in fact, a measure of the confidence of troops of their commander. That's an interesting point, right? How do you have high morale? It's a measurement of how confident the troops are. So when the, when, when the troops are confident or the, or the employees are confident in the boss, morale is high. When they're not confident, morale is low. And by the way, with low morale, you're not winning. <laughs> Continuing on, there is no book of rules which will help a commander to gain the complete trust and confidence of his men. Each commander will adopt his own methods and say the ones best suited to his own personality. Suffice it to say that he must be known, must be known personally to them, and that success in battle will produce quick results. All soldiers will follow a successful general. No commander, however, will gain the confidence of his troops unless he is known and well known to them. They must often see him and, if possible, hear him speak. A commander should take every opportunity of talking to his officers and men. It will repay him according to his worth. Got to get out there and talk to the troops. There are other factors also which have a big effect on morale. The home front and the battle on the front nowadays are, as, ever, as never before, very closely linked. So you gotta, gotta keep that morale up. You gotta make sure everything's going good on the home front. Is he, imagine what it's linked like now. I mean, this is he's talking about World War II. Mm-hmm. World War II. Hey, we're very closely linked because I can write a letter that's gonna get to my wife nine weeks from now. Right now, we got brothers on Facebook Live <laughs> nightly. Continuing on, just as success is a great stimulus to morale, so nothing lowers morale so quickly as failure. Therefore, there must be no failures. Great and lasting harm can be done to morale by undertaking operations for which the troops concerned are not ready or or trained, and which they are likely to end in failure. I have therefore made it a rule to limit the scope of any operation to what can be achieved successfully. So again, this sounds super risk averse, and that's that's that is hey i'm not going to do anything that i don't know we can achieve it then again how often do you want to be rolling the dice w- why not say you know what well let's give it another month let's train a little bit more why do we have to do this right now yeah. you know and i certainly think that there's times when you have to take risk and you're going to do some things that maybe you don't know if you can get away with mm-hmm. and there can be times where you're forced into that position as well like you're yeah. being attacked and hey we can i'm not sure if a flank is going to work but we can either sit here and get attacked and get flanked by them or we can go and flank ourselves. Yeah. Like, let's, let's go make this happen. So I think we need to make sure we don't take that, that comment to the extreme because that can be a bit much, but consider it, consider it deeply. And I think probably the reason why this, this is probably one of those points where, you know, he said in the beginning of this, he made the premise that, um, that hey, this is a this is this is for army command, right? Or at least divisional command. We're talking you're in charge of ten thousand people or more. So what he's saying, maybe and I guess it, it becomes more acceptable of a rule. You don't want to risk ten thousand. You don't want to risk an entire army or an entire division on something that you may or may not be successful at, right? Mm. Maybe we need to reassess if we're not sure we can make this happen. Maybe we need to reassess if we're going to go forward or not. Another thing that today has a big effect on morale is the standard of medical care, which soldiers can expect. So you you got that. And then we get to a commander must make a very close study of human nature. The raw material with which he has to deal are men. And it is important to remember that all men are different. 
What a commander makes of the human material at his disposal will depend entirely on himself. I have found that every division which has fought under my command has had a different characteristics. Each division was good at a different type of battle, and it is vital that the commander should gauge what type of battle is best at and make sure that each division is at the right point when required. So even in the, quote, uniformity of the military, they have differences. They're human beings, and those, those differences are reflected through whole units. The difference between divisions is based partly on the individual, individuality of the commander of the division and partly on the type of men of whom the division is composed. I found, for instance, that some divisions were outstandingly good at the breakthrough attack but were not so good at the deliberate set-piece affair. Some divisions were best at night, some by day. For a solid killing match, certain types of men were better than others, and so on. Each division develops an individuality of its own, which I consider a high commander must study. I was in the airport, and I ran into a dude from South Africa Mm -hmm. who is in the game, kind of big time. And... He was talking about, he says, yes, and I can't do it on their accent, <laughs> but he was saying that he had, he worked construction, he was a construction guy, and he had a crew, and he gave his crew a name. And I should have asked him what the name of the crew was, but I didn't, mm-hmm. but I'm sure they gave him, he gave him some kind of name. And he was like, he was just so pumped, and he goes, yeah, I, I read it in Hackworth too, and then I, I did it, because you did it, and... He goes, it really worked, mate. Mm -hmm. It was all fired up. Because you can change the personality of something. You can change the the personality of a unit like that. Mm -hmm. You can do it. It works. In the same way, all generals differ and must be selected for the job in hand. No two jobs, no two problems are ever the same, and the character of the job must be matched to that of the commander selected to undertake it. One of the most important functions of a commander in war is to make sure that he has the right man in the right place to tackle the job in hand. So think about that. When you're in charge of a team, when you're in charge of a business, one of the most important things that you do is put the right people in the right job. Some people are sensitive to that. You know? So when I'm like, hey, hey, Bill. I'm not giving you this off. I'm giving it to Echo. And Bill gets mad and frustrated and he thinks Echo doesn't deserve it. Mm-hmm. Like, man, we got to have a good enough relationship and trust that when I say, hey, Bill, this op's not for you. I'm giving it to Echo. And he goes, okay, cool. Let me know what's coming down the pipe. Let me know what I can get ready for. Let me know how I can support. Yeah. Yeah, that. Remember remember the movie Major League? Charlie Sheen? Come on. Yeah. I, think I, I remember the movie. Yeah, yes. I don't think I ever sat through that whole movie. Oh, actually, you know what? I think I asked you that before. Yeah. I think you said the same thing. So yeah. there's this part where, okay, so Charlie Sheen, right? He got mm-hmm. his glasses. He, oh, yeah, that's what we were talking about last time. So last time, or as far as Major League goes, the movie Major League. Mm-hmm. So Charlie Sheen, he had all this crazy power mm-hmm. and speed in his fastball. Oh, yeah. But no uh, control. No control. Yeah. Then they find out whatever. He can't see that good. They give him some glasses. Boom. He, he brings it all together. They start winning all this stuff, right? So he's starting. The other guy who was starting before him is named Harris. Older guy. Mm-hmm. But, you know, has the basically the more consi- – like, he's consistent. He's mm-hmm. not, like, legit like Charlie Sheen, but he's consistent, you know. So they're about to play the y- – fast forward. They're about to play the Yankees, mm-hmm. right, in the big game. Or the Is that called the World Series? series or or <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, this big deal. Uh-huh. And, it's you know, so deal. the general manager, Lou, calls Charlie Sheen. What was his name in the movie, Charlie Sheen? Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Anyway, call, calls Charlie Sheen uh, to the back of the bus, and he's like, hey – I'm going to start Harris against the Yankees. He just has a better reputation against them and, you know, more more experience, whatever. And then Charlie Sheen was like, oh, yeah, you know, whatever's best for the team. And he left. And he, that was sort of it. So he was good with it. No, well, he, the movie goes on, and he's not good with it. He expressed himself like he was good with it, and he said the right things. But later on, he goes on, like, goes drinking by himself or something. 
then he, wind, <laughs> then he winds up hooking up with like one of his teammates' wife, and that was all. Uh, but that's a whole nother okay. story, though. Yeah, we don't that, care you know, about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we don't actually care about any of this, but <laughs> <laughs> we definitely don't care about that part. Rick Vaughn, that's his name. <laughs> Wild Thing, Rick Vaughn. There you go. But yeah. same deal, though, right? You got to get right the right guys. Right yeah. Yes. And of course, you even, nailed it. Yeah. <laughs> nailed it, bro. <laughs> Eventually, uh, Harris, you know, he does okay, you know, and then they bring out Rick Vaughn to, fin- to close out the game or whatever to yeah. win. So there you go. Boom. All right. Win-win. Back to the book. Back to the <laughs> book. If a commander thinks that all men are the same and he treats the mass of human material accordingly, he will fail. The soldiers of today have different standards and require more enlightened handling than the soldiers of bygone days. This is again where he starts to, you realize that this guy, even though he tries to come across all hard, he's actually very thoughtful about understanding humans. Mm -hmm. Back to the book. They will no longer follow blindly and unquestionably to an unknown end. Today, therefore, a commander must ensure that his troops always know what they are being asked to do and how that fits in with the larger plan. I have always, in other words, they got to know why they're doing what they're doing. I have always insisted that before a battle, the essentials of the plan are known right through the chain of command and finally down to the rank and file. The troops must know how a commander is going to fight the battle and what part they are going to play in it. This must be explained to them by word of mouth for that counts far more than the written word. And then when the battle has been won and the troops see that the battle has gone as the commander said it would, their confidence in the high command will be very great. This confidence is beyond price. The problem with that statement is it puts pressure on you to stick to a plan. Just get like that, that makes you think, oh, I'm just gonna stick with it. Because yeah. I want everyone to think that it went the way I, want, I wanted it to go, no. Don't just stick with a plan. If it's not working, it's not working. Mm. Shift. A commander must watch carefully his own morale. A battle is a contest between the will of two opposing commanders. The one whose heart fails when the issue hangs in the balance will lose the battle. A commander, in fact, must throughout radiate confidence in his plan and operations, even though inwardly he may not be too sure of the outcome. <laughs> so this is one of those other things, you know? People talk about transparency, sure. right? Yeah. Transparency. transparency. Yeah. Well, guess what? And it's like, oh yeah, there's a book. There's all kinds of book about transparency. Yeah. Like, oh, you gotta be fully transparent <clears throat> with everyone. It's like, mm. No, actually, sometimes. If I'm a little more nervous about what we're doing and I start to show that, everyone's gonna be nervous yeah. about what we're doing. Yeah, man. And the bad scene. Yeah, they can uh and sometimes too where like like how you mentioned before, like some people can't take the truth, you know? Like so like if there's certain shifts gonna be made or certain like rules gonna be implemented or whatever. Yeah. You know, like Hey, we're we're gonna move. We're gonna demote this, or we're gonna move this person out of this department because he's just he he's ir- he stinks or something. Like he has bo and he's irritating <laughs> everybody, you know, kind of thing. Okay, he's okay, and he'll be, he'll just do just as good a work down here. Yeah, you know, in where the basement alone. where he's by himself. <laughs> exactly right, you know. And it's like, hey, and then well, hey, we're gonna shift you over here, and, and he's gonna be like, oh, cool. Well, like, why though? Like, I'm down to do it, but why? Do you be transparent? Maybe, maybe uh, not. But no, you run no, the you don't. well. <laughs> you uh, run the risk. I mean, is what, what I'm wait, saying. Well, the, the the good thing to do would be like, hey man, hey, bro, <laughs> let me ask you something. <laughs> yeah, if I had sure. a booger hanging out of my nose, would you want? Would you would? If you had a booger hanging out of your nose, would you want me to tell you? Yeah, well, yeah. Everyone says, yeah, of course. Yeah. Cool, you stink. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, you dang, smell that's, bad. That's good. Hey, yeah, what about stinky good. geese on the mat? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Somebody's got to let them know, bro. You gotta wash that thing. Yes. You might need a new ghee. Yeah. You know, some people they they have this old ratty ghee. The smell is embedded in those things. I had ghees like that. Yeah. Where it's like you wash it, and then you wash it, and you take it out. You put it on for four minutes, and you yeah. go, oh yeah, I gotta throw this thing away. This thing stanks. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. That's true. That that would be a better way to do it. That but you way. You can't say, hey, why don't you move to the beginner class? <laughs> <laughs> go drill no, in the go corner drill in the corner over there. Go work with the, the, the grappling dummy over there. <laughs> it's like, no, that's not cool. You need to tell a brother, yeah. hey, man, 
yeah. you be stinking. You, yeah. need, you need to wash your gi. You yes. need to wash your gi immediately. Yeah. But. So this is this is one of those things where if you if you need to talk to them, right? Even in that situation, you do need to tell the truth. Yeah. You know, you do need to say, "Hey, listen, man, I don't know what's up with your hygiene." <laughs> <laughs> okay. But it needs some work. All right. So, what if the company is taking this massive financial hit and layoffs are coming straight mm-hmm. up? Mm-hmm. You lay off one guy, you lay off two guys. Do you be transparent? Like, hey, guys, we're taking a massive hit. We're laying off a bunch of people. Well, yeah. In that in that case, you have to say, hey, listen, this is what's going on. This is where we're at, and we're gonna do our best. And the best way we can do this is by buckling down hard and working hard. But right now, it's going to be tight. Mm. Going, going to go through a tight quarter right now. Yeah. We had to let go of two guys. We're going to try and maintain what we got, but I can't promise you anything. Right? Yeah. You got to be, yes, so yes, maybe, I'm going to be truthful. So maybe it is better to be transparent. Most of the time, it is. Yeah. Most of the time, it is. What we do, it's in this situation, what we're talking about is. If you lack confidence in what you're doing, oh, right. and you start to reveal that to, to start people, letting it show. Yeah, 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 gotcha. then, then that's not good. Mm. And you know, there's there's time now. Let's say let's say Echo, let's say I didn't think you were cognitively capable of doing a job at the next level. Mm-hmm. I might not necessarily tell you that because that's something that you can't necessarily change. You can't go home, take a shower, and get smarter, right? It doesn't, yeah, no. doesn't work that way. <laughs> no, sir, like you doesn't. can't You can't put on a deodorant and now you're smarter. That doesn't work. Yeah. It's, it, be smelling bad is not, a, is not necessarily a bad problem because it's something that can be fixed. Yeah. But if you, if you aren't smart enough, well, then we have a, we have a situation. You can't yeah. really, I mean, you can study, you can work, but you're not gonna get smarter, yeah. right? So, it might not be a great idea for me to say, well, you know, I, I decided not to, you know, you're not getting, prom- I promoted Billy because you're you're dumb. Yeah, he's just a lot smarter yeah, than you are. Here's the deal, man, just straight up, you're not that smart, right? <laughs> sure. So yeah. I couldn't put you in charge of anything because you're not smart. Now, that's different than me saying, hey, listen, man, six months ago if I was like, hey, listen, man, you need to start paying attention because what you're doing right now, if you're gonna move up, you gotta really know. You get, It's gonna take you some extra study. And look, I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed, and I, I know I have to work hard at making this stuff happen. Do you look at your Do you look at your manuals at all? Have you been studying your manuals? You need to like dig into your manuals and really know this stuff. Hmm. If you think you're gonna get promoted, you're not gonna get promoted unless you know this stuff like the back of your hand. You need to get in the game. So if we've already been through that whole thing, right. and you actually got out the manuals and you tried and you didn't make anything happen, well, guess what? Hey, man, there's just not that many opportunities at this next level. And by the way, I think there's <laughs> another kind of course of a career course that I have thinking for you. You know, mm-hmm. so let's talk about that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, fully. Something that something that requires. Large biceps, I think, is going to be <laughs> your area of expertise. <laughs> sure. Thanks. Check. Going back to the book. In order that he may keep clear of unimportant details and thus have time for the quiet thought and reflection, a higher commander must work through a chief of staff and thus avoid having to deal separately with the heads of all branches. So far as I'm aware, the British Army is the only army which was which does not adopt the chief of staff system. In my own experience, it is quite possible to it is quite impossible to exercise high command successfully in war without it. I have adopted the chief of staff system myself throughout this war and could not have succeeded otherwise. So you got to have someone that's going to handle things for you, the little things. You know, I always talked about the um, the senior enlisted guy in a a, a platoon chief or in a task unit or in a platoon or in a company, an army company, the senior enlisted guy, I always said, was the action arm of the commander. So when you need something done, Mm -hmm. I don't have time to go do it myself. And if I go do do it myself, then I've lost the bigger picture. But if I have something critical, you've got the senior enlisted individual that has the most tactical experience, has the most authority, the most respect. So when you say, hey, chief, that building over there hasn't been cleared yet, I don't know what's going on, Go clear that thing and he'll say Roger that or the platoon sergeant or mm-hmm. the company first sergeant Those guys should have the experience and the tactical expertise and then be utilized as the action arm 
that can make things happen. Now, that's not exactly what a chief of staff of is. It's actually quite different, but it's similar in the fact that you can't get sucked into the weeds. Mm-hmm. And if you if you're the commander of a of a division and you're in the weeds all the time, you don't have you can't see what's happening. And it's the same thing in a business. Mm-hmm. If if the if the CEO of the business is running the business daily. He's not looking up and out. He's looking down and in, and that's not going to allow him to make foresee what's coming down the pipe in the future. Mm. And that's pretty much what it says here. No officer whose daily life is spent in the consideration of details or who has not time for quiet thought and reflection can make a sound plan of battle or conduct large-scale operations. The wise commander is the one who uses a chief of staff who sees very few papers or letters himself and who sees that the majority of reports that are made to him are verbal and short. <laughs> Only in this way, giving himself plenty of time for quiet thought and reflection, will he be will he keep himself mentally fresh and capable of producing the sound plan of operations which will defeat his enemy. For the plan of operations must always be made by the commander and he must not be for and must not be forced upon him by his staff, by his, by his circumstances, or by the enemy. That's pretty important. Why are you allowing the circumstances or the enemy to dictate how you're going to do things. That's not a good call. A commander must decide how he will fight the battle before it begins. He must decide how he will use the military effort at his disposal to force the battle to swing the way he wishes it to go. To be able to do this, his dispositions must be so balanced that he can ignore enemy reactions and continue with his own plan until he is certain of success. He has got to strive to read the mind of his opponent, to anticipate have enemy reactions to his own moves, and to take quick steps to prevent any enemy interference with his own plan. Again, this is a little bit sketchy to me because now we're talking about, hey, I'm just driving forward with my plan no matter what. I don't like that attitude. I want to be flexible. I'm going to try and stick to my plan, mm-hmm. but I'm going to be flexible. This this is one where, you know, I, I man, I don't even know. If, this is This is one of those things where, Sometimes I would get guys that would, there'd be a little change. They'd come up with a plan. They'd spend all this time planning for a mission and there'd be a little change. Maybe they're getting ready to go out and some imagery comes in and it shows something a little bit different or maybe they get some intel that's a little bit different and they decide they're gonna, they've already planned, they've already rehearsed, they already know what they're doing, everyone's kind of walked through and they decide they're gonna change their whole plan because mm. of some little thing. <laughs> and I would say, man, don't change your whole plan. You want to make a little adjustment? You want to take a little fire team and have them make an adjustment? Take a squad, make them do something? That's that's okay. Don't don't try and rearrange your whole plan. You've already rehearsed. You have to unrehearse. You know how hard that is? Yeah. You have to unprogram your team. Yeah. That is really hard to do. Yeah. So sometimes, and I used to, uh, this is actually one of those things that that slowly I don't really talk about very often because but I used to it used to be in the the combat leadership brief I used to give. It used to say, "Don't fall for six percent advantage over the enemy." And what I meant by that was, and I used to draw a target up on the on the dry erase board, and I'd say, "Okay, you're going to take down this target." So you come up with a plan. How do you always want to do it? And I was just, oh, we set up an L and base and maneuver. Okay, cool. You're getting ready to go out and do this, and you find out that there's an outhouse over the berm over here. And there's a chance, two o'clock in the morning, that the guy could be in that outhouse. What do you want to do? And some guys would completely change their whole plan. Hmm. Completely change their whole plan. Meanwhile, we're launching in two minutes or eight minutes or 20 mm-hmm. minutes. They've planned this. They've rehearsed it. Everyone knows what their job was. The whole team came up with a plan together. I mean, it's like a, it's really in their brains. And now they see this little detail. Because mm-hmm. there's a chance that at three o'clock in the morning when you hit this target that the The guy that you're looking for is in the outhouse. So we're gonna change our whole plan to make up for this tiny percentage chance that this guy's even in the outhouse. Mm -hmm. Not a good call. Mm -hmm. Can you break off a fire team that's gonna maneuver to a position where they can at least keep an eye on the outhouse? That's fine. Mm -hmm. But don't change your whole damn plan based on this little 6% chance that the enemy might do something you didn't expect. Or no, the the enemy, that something is very unlikely of happening. It's not that you didn't expect it. Things that you don't expect, that's why you have contingency plans. Mm-hmm. Which is like, hey, when we fly in, if we see any other outbuildings that we missed on the imagery, we have a fire team designated to go and, you know, get eyes on those things from the high ground. Oh, okay, cool. That's mm-hmm. a contingency plan. Mm-hmm. That works. 
going back to the uh, commander here, he has got always to be a very clear thinker and must aim to be always one move ahead of his opponent. I actually prefer to be about five moves ahead of my opponent. To do this, he must simplify the problem. Whenever a problem arises, he must think out the few points which will form the framework of the solution. The few things that will really matter. So long as the solution to the problem is based on those few things that really matter, the solution will be on the right lines. Solid. Mm-hmm. Solid. <clears throat> you have like this 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 pathway. And as long in the path at the end of the pathway is what you want to achieve. As long as you're doing things that are on the pathway, you're go, you're getting there. Mm-hmm. When you start doing things that are off the pathway, we get a problem. Sometimes you gotta look at your, your subordinates and say, Hey, is that even on the path yeah, in the yeah. direction that we're heading? Because it doesn't seem like it to me. Mm-hmm. A commander must at all times exercise personal command. That is to say, he must give must see and give full verbal orders or instructions to his subordinate generals on how the battle is to be fought. Operational command in the field must be direct and personal. No written order can ever be the equivalent of a direct verbal command. Interesting. And I've my standard is I do both. I do both. I say, hey, Echo, here's what we're doing. Hey, do you understand this? Do you got any questions? Cool, and I send you a, a message that says, hey, Echo, this is what we talked about, this is what you're doing, making sure you understand. Mm. So if I can, I'm gonna do both. If you can only do one, yes, verbal is better. Most of the time. A commander must therefore understand how to give verbal orders to his subordinates. No two generals are the same. Each will require different treatment. Each will react differently. By exercising personal command, a commander can exert a far greater and more exact influence on the battle, and the confidence which will grow up between the commander and his generals will be of great value. The whole chain of command can thus and only thus be built into a united team whose strength is based on mutual confidence and understanding understanding relationships that's all relationships is what he's talking about right there Mm. when the whole army is built into one great team united in working all out for a common purpose the result is terrific success in war is due to good teamwork by all members of the fighting forces and to the correct use which is made of all members by the team of the team by the commander and his staff but failure in war is always due to one of two causes to faulty command or to bad staff work and sometimes to both i can think of no instance where the failure has been due to a failure of the fighting man the british fighting man will always do what is asked of him but you must make sure that he understands what he is asked to do and also that it is within his capacity to do it. If your team is not doing what it is you want them to do, the first person you should check is yourself. If you're giving people complex orders that they don't understand, there's no possible way that they can execute those plans. And here's how he closes this out. Finally, I do not believe that today a commander can inspire great armies or single units or even individual men and lead them to achieve great victories unless he has a proper sense of religious truth. And he must be prepared to acknowledge it and to lead his troops in the light of that truth. He must always keep his finger on the spiritual pulse of his army. And he must be very sure that the spiritual purpose which inspires them is right and true and it's clearly expounded to one and all. Unless he does this, he can expect no lasting success. So you gotta believe in what you're doing. For all leadership, I believe, is based on the spiritual quality, the power to inspire others to follow. And this spiritual quality may be for good or may be for evil. In many cases, this quality has been devoted toward personal ends and was partly or wholly evil. And whenever this was so, in the end, it failed. 
for leadership which is evil while it may temporarily succeed always carries within it the seeds of its own destruction that's a that's that's a solid one leadership which is evil while it may temporarily succeed always carries within it the seeds of its own destruction and that is a theory that i fully believe in and i mean i believe in it on that level on that high consequence level but i also believe it on a on a much less dramatic level and this is something that you deal with every day that and that's this the leader that is looking out for himself the leader that puts himself above his team that leader is eventually going to fail even though they may temporarily succeed same thing they may temporarily succeed but eventually they are going to fail that's what's going to happen and i will tell you something else that is true and that is the opposite is that of that and that is if you are doing the right things for the right things for the right reasons then you may temporarily fail but you will have the seeds for victory the seeds for victory and the reason that i say seeds is very specific there's a reason why I'm saying that is because seeds are not guaranteed to grow right just because you have good intention doesn't mean that you're going to win it doesn't mean that you're going to achieve victory it means you have the seeds for victory because once you plant those seeds you have to water them and you have to nourish them and you have to protect them from birds and from squirrels and from vermin and you have to work you have to plant those seeds and then you have to make those seeds grow and if you do that and you continue to do that then you move forward and you're doing it for the right reasons in the end you are going to win and you know that that middle section of this Monty went pretty deep talking about morale and he has a whole nother section here that I've got on morale but I think we're going to save that for another podcast since we're already two hours deep (laughs) until then Echo Charles if we want to keep our morale high if we want to nourish the seeds and we want to protect them sure and we want to do the right things for the right reason always so that we can win yes dominate are we are we doing we're dominate look, we're kind yeah. of looking to dominate. Think, think we're, we're looking to dominate look, look, we're possibly yeah. looking to dominate we're not looking yeah. to dominate man <laughs> no but you gotta you gotta be able to <sighs> we'll probably come we'll revisit that word we'll yeah. do the full we'll do the full study of that word yeah and dig deep at a minimum it means hey we're gonna dominate I'm gonna, I'm, hey, this guy dominates the room in a positive way. Yeah. At the extreme, it's like this guy just has a dominant personality. Yeah. The problem is, how often do you see a person with a dominant per- personality that rubs everyone the wrong way? Happens yeah. all the time. Dominant, like domineering. Yeah, this guy's Dom- got a dominating. No one, no one wants him on the team. Yeah. Because you can't get a word in edgewise. That's why I question the use of this word. Yeah. Now, that being said, and I can see this. Uh-huh. I can see this. Just because someone has the will to dominate and it's strong doesn't mean that they sit there and rub everyone the wrong way because if they really had the will to dominate, what they would do is back off and allow others to step up and allow others to have their say and allow others to try and lead and to actually lead. If they were really going to play the game, they might have the strongest will to dominate but they don't act that way because they realize that that's counterproductive to actually dominating. Yeah. You look like you're confused. I mean, yeah, no, yeah. I mean, I don't know so, so much check that it I'm out. confused, but the, I think that if just, I feel like there's just a di- there's a more general broad use or meaning for that word. That's what I think. So I, I you know. think you're right. That being said, 
it, it could also be if you have somebody that has a strong, incredibly powerful will to dominate, but they realize that that is abrasive and it is not the best way to actually win in a situation, they will modulate and they will tamper that will to dominate yeah. so that it best serves the accomplishment of the mission and therefore best serves their domination. Yeah, and I could <laughs> dig it. You know, it just does feel at this at this point right now it feels like that might be kind it's, of a reach. It's like that um, thing that I talked about at the muster of of what is what is leadership. And and I talk about how like leadership is winning at all costs. Yeah. And there's been some people that say, "Well, I don't know if I w- winning at all costs seems like a bad attitude." Right. But the whole because you put a clip like that for an advertisement for the muster in a little muster clip. Sure. You put me going, leadership is winning at all costs, right? And there sure. was someone that commented, commented on our, on the Echelon Front Extreme Ownership Facebook private group mm-hmm. that, you know, I don't know if I like this. It seems a little bit, that doesn't seem like a good attitude. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I replied that, hey, you have to hear the whole thing. That's yeah. only, that's only, uh, a few lines, seconds yeah. because what it goes on to say is if you really want to win mm. then you'll compromise then you'll make exceptions then you'll yeah. build relationships and you'll take a back step and you'll put your you will subordinate your ego yeah that was the biggest thing that's that I got the biggest from thing. it you will subordinate your ego because you will put the mission above your own personal will to dominate yeah you'll you'll subordinate your will to dominate so that you can actually win in the long term, in the long game. Yeah, and it's important to remember, <clears throat> if you heard here the whole speech or whatever, or the whole segment, we'll say, yeah. is that, yeah, you talk like a lot about um, where like there's like battles and then there's the overall victory and like there's all this stuff. Yeah. And then, and sure, there's the, the dramatic parts when you're like, nothing's gonna get in my way, yep. you know, yep. I'm gonna yep. win yep. at all costs. But, yeah, like you sacrifice so much where, okay, so when you say win at all costs, it kind of, this is what it sounds like if you just hear that line yeah, and nothing's going to get in my, it sounds like even at the cost of like yeah. half my men or no, something yeah, like that. Not only that, but in the corporate world, it's like, I'll just step on anyone I need to right. win. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll uh, send bad product out to the consumers yeah. and I don't care if they get hurt or I don't care if it's, I don't care if whatever, I'm just going to win. I'm here. Yeah. Like that. Yes. That's what that's what people think. When so they yeah. So in that guy's defense, it sounds like that. But again, the whole speech, it really, I mean, really, the, one of the main, actually, the takeaway, if not anything, is like winning. What is winning? Like, w- yeah. w- you know, if I lose half my men, it, did you really win? I think yeah. you actually say that oh, yeah, exact yeah. thing. Yeah, for sure. You're like, no, I, that, that's not. Well, a not victory. only that, because you, it's not a victory, but also, how can you carry on with your mission? You can't. You're, you're, exactly. you're mission incapable now. Yeah. I'm so. actually putting. I'm actually putting that. I'm gonna. I'm gonna write that down capture that and i'm going to redo it for ef online what that that that, that, part? that, that part yeah you know so that Makes way people sense. can understand what winning at all costs what yeah. what it means what i'm talking about yeah so we'll put that on ef online yeah if anybody wants to check that out yeah if you don't know what that is ef online is a interactive leadership training from my company echelon front where we travel the world sure. teaching companies, businesses, organizations about leadership. In the course of doing that, we eventually got to a point where A, we couldn't service all the people that wanted our service, and B, some of the companies that we could service, we couldn't service all their employees because they have 50,000 employees and they want to have everyone yeah. get trained by Echelon Front. So mm. talking to Leif during a board meeting, are you surf <laughs> <board> meeting? <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. So Leif and I were surfing. I said, uh, brother, we need to figure out a way to scale this stuff. Sure. And we, you know, I, I said, let's, let's look at doing something online. And Leif was initially like, mm. Which makes sense, by the way. Yeah, for sure. No, and I, I, I wanted to explore it. I wasn't like all in out of the gate, but I was feeling pretty good about it because mm. I'd seen some stuff. Leif really hadn't seen anything. You know, he'd basically seen... Well, you used to get trained online in the Navy. Yeah. Like for some, just the most ridiculous sort of 
uh, things. They send you some online training course yeah. about if you get a DUI, this is you, you know check this box if you think you're going to be in trouble. Yes, you know <laughs> they're just really not the best training, and that's yeah. kind of what Leif had in mind. Yeah, but eventually we decided to take a look at it. Once we looked at it, it's like oh man, this, the capability is unbelievable to do interactive training and all that stuff. So we invested in it we did it and now we've got this thing and we're using it primarily uh, we, we're using it primarily for our for our enterprise clients so when echelon front is working with a company and they go well what are we going to do with our other fourteen thousand employees how are we going to train them well here you go now yeah. now that's what they're doing they're training through that great feedback and you know the the decision was well you know there's not everyone is in a big company and so maybe some of the smaller companies or just individuals, because yeah. because sometimes you know look at sometimes people come to the muster and they're paying their own way to come to the muster obviously, yeah. and their their company's not supporting it, but they want to improve so yeah. that's why they're there at the yeah. muster. Thanks. Well, it's the same thing with EF online. Some sometimes you might just do it on your own because you want to become a better leader. Why not get the experience of the echelon front team, the the principles in practice? You get to try them. So that's. That's what it is. So, anyways, we we add modules every month, like right. new training, yeah. and so I'm gonna put the what is leadership and the winning at all costs thing on there, so people can listen to what that's really about and what it really means. Yeah, yeah, that broader view is important, in my opinion. Also, what's important, in my opinion, is the gi you get <laughs> for jujitsu when you're doing jujitsu. Yes, here's the thing. When you start jujitsu and you put on a gi, you don't have any basis for comparison. You're not going to understand how important that is. Do you want to put on a straight jacket when you take a drive around the block? No. Correct. Sometimes you have to, but. <laughs> Neither do I. And that's what it'll feel like if you buy one of these other gis. Yeah. Sometimes. Anyway, so the gi you get is origin. You get an origin gi. Many selections on there. Yeah. To fit who you are. And also, there's jeans on there. Yes. There jeans. Is. Yeah. No. Did I say origin jeans? Origin made in America. American denim. American denim. And they Which are, I don't have. They are with. live. Well, you need to order a pair then. Oh, all right. Maybe get, I will. Get some. Okay. Oh, all right. There you go. Yeah, they're live. They are awesome. Highest quality possible. Every detail. Go if you want to find out what because the, the jeans there right now the price point is one hundred and twenty four bucks. That's a lot of money for a pair of jeans. Mm -hmm. I understand that. If you buy two pairs, it's ninety nine bucks each. Here's the deal. If you want to know why they cost that much, go on to Origin BJJ um, Facebook and mm -hmm. watch Pete's video where he breaks down the details in the jeans. You can mm. see the whole thing, why every little detail is covered, denim pockets, belt, every little thing is done perfectly to the next level. Mm. And so they're more expensive. They're also more expensive because we're just kicking it off. Once we get, once we keep b building them, we'll get more efficient. So yeah, eventually the price is gonna come down. If you can't afford them right now, hey man, it's cool. It's cool, I get it. Do jeans have the whole situation of the first edition? Well, they are technically right now, you can get first edition. first edition, right? yes. Yeah, but that would be like a first batch of yeah. them. First well, run, what do you call first them? First edition is, is live right now. There yeah, you go. first Boom. edition. Bro, you ever seen those like designer jeans that cost like $300, how they're made? This yeah. is where you see people that are scraping them with rocks and yeah, stuff. Yeah, no, well, no, no, no. It's because I've it's seen worse. that. It's worse than that. So they get like regular jeans or whatever, and it's a certain color, and it's just denim from wherever, mm. and they, you know, this factory in I forget where, yeah. but you know, a factory in a, a factory it, in, in some China, country. Yeah, I think or it's China in Pakistan or yeah. in India, and there's a, a you know these little kids that are nine years old exposed to chemicals. Yeah. Yeah, right yeah. Well, about. the one I saw, the one I saw on a little bit, it was more tame than that. But nonetheless, they were like super, like they're like three hundred dollars jeans or mm. two fifty or something like this. And they go and the way they're made, I'm like, bro, how is how is that even worth three hundred dollars? Like they they cut the jeans like normal, mm -hmm. and it's like denim, you know, whatever. Yeah. And then they do them like, and they put like this steam on them, and then they send it to the next person, yeah. the next station in the yeah. factory. Yeah. The next station has this like, it's almost like a like a fishing line mm -hmm. on a 
what do you call it, like a wheel, like oh, a to spinner. make it look abused or yes, whatever. Yes, yeah, exactly yeah. right. So it goes and it spins on the jeans and it makes it look a certain level of abused. Yeah. Or or weathered. What do you call them? Dis, dis, yeah. Distressed. Distressed. And then it goes to the next little station and the, and this person at the station is just doing every single one. Same yeah. thing. You know, next station. The next station has like a little a, another thing to help yeah. it kind of do it. The next station fold it and. So I watched that thing with Pete and my yeah. point. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, man, that makes sense. This all makes sense. Like, this is deep, you know? This is good. Made me want to get one, obviously. But <laughs> I thought back to that factory, and I'm thinking, man, how is that worth, like, $300 or whatever yeah. for that thing? It was such a throwaway process, like, when you, yeah. you know, when you see it and feel it. So I dig it, man. I dig it. And they are made in America, by the way. Yeah, for sure. They're made in America. They're made in Maine. They're... The cotton's from America, is dyed in America, it's woven in America, and yeah, the price point is is more expensive than what you're going to pay. And hey, you know, I don't want you to go out and spend your last dollar on this pair of Origin jeans. No, man. But if you want to help out and you want the best, they are the best possible jeans you get. If you want them, then cool. That'd be cool. Yep. Don't, but don't need to freak out. I'm not... Get freaking out on my end. Mm-hmm. We're trying to make good. We're trying to make good quality products, and our real mission is long term mission: bring manufacturing back to America. Yep. We want these. We want to get these jeans down to a price point. How do we do that? Increase the volume. Make more of them. Mm-hmm. There'll be economies of scale. We'll be able to lower the prices for sure. Absolutely. You know what? We talked to some jean people, denim people. They sure. they they wanted us to charge three hundred dollars for these jeans. Yeah. Because they're like, well, you know, these are. Wait, what did they say they were? Premium. Yeah, premium jeans, but there was another word too. Anyways, you know, there's there's people that pay that kind of money for jeans. Right. I'm not one of them. Yeah, no. You know? I mean, yeah. I don't know. But anyways. But yeah, either way, well, the good news about the whole situation, including Made in America, they do have other stuff. So, and, and man, I haven't talked about these shorts. So, and I don't know if you notice what I wear all the time. Yes. But. <laughs> The only thing I wear is these shorts. Only one. Yeah. Straight up. I mean, unless it's like, you know, to train or something like yeah. this, but like just around is only the origin shorts. I've yeah. heard of shark, shark fin fin. or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> I have like six pairs of them. And it's like the same thing. So I'm sure it's like, you know, if you go through your routine, like people yeah. at the store, they're like, bro, this guy wears the same shorts every day, bro. Well, one of them has a green logo. The other one has a black logo. Mm. Either way, these are literally the best shorts in the, like ever made. That I've put on Dang. straight up, yes. So you can get those. Echo Charlie, there you go. Coming that's made in, in America. Oh, big time, and I'm. So, that's for real, though. Yeah. Well, you also said that about their their joggers. Well, <laughs> you know, those are the most comfortable. Yeah, for sure. And yeah. and well, and, and you know what? Did, let me, it, did let, I show you when I tried on joggers? You told me <laughs> about so it. So yeah. ridiculous. Yeah, that, the whole idea sounds yeah. sounds ridiculous. So. Yeah. You don't have a jogger. Uh, what do you call physique? physique. Yeah. What do you need? To, what's a jogger Bro, physique? Uh, More like skinny I, knees it, or whatnot? <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, I, th- I don't know that I can put my finger on what exactly a jogger physique is, but I can tell you that I don't you have don't it. Have it. I, yes, I, sir. I confirm that. Yes. Yeah, so don't worry about the joggers if you're Jocko. But if you're anyone else, those joggers are factually yeah. the most comfortable uh, jogger sweat situation clothes in existence currently <laughs> currently they got some supplements too uh joint warfare krill oil discipline discipline go we were on a skype or a or a yeah this business skype call today sure. and jason gardner was on and he you know you can you have a little video uh and my little video i don't know which one J- no little video like skype skype you know what oh, skype okay. is it's yeah, video okay. comp video teleconferencing yeah okay jason i Gar- know what you mean okay. jason gardner's like like pulls out his bottle of discipline go and <laughs> opens it up and like takes one and you know Jason's uh, super animated yes you know and he gets this big yeah. wired smile on his face because he took a couple hits of the discipline go yeah. anyways so we, we got that get, if you need to get in the zone we also have milk mint milk peanut butter milk vanilla gorilla the darkness chocolate and now live strawberry strawberry slayer milk strawberry slayer <laughs> oh yeah okay. boy <laughs> all right all right so let me tell you get that strawberry yeah. just straight up get that strawberry that thing is a dessert dang okay so we like strawberry. i don't know how well 
it's it's the 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 kids the warrior kid milk which mm. strawberries awesome the chocolate's good the strawberries awesome the chocolate's good too mm. the strawberries awesome and I didn't think I just was telling Brian like no hey man I don't care just put a bigger scoop in or whatever just yeah. reduplicate it yeah. but you know he's like no it's got to have more protein it's adults blah 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 mm. and somehow he made it it's actually it's actually better or at least as good it might be better Dang, that's saying a lot it's so good. Dude, it's so good. It's ridiculous. It's a straight up dessert. It tastes like a milkshake, straight up. If you mix it with milk, which is what I mix it with, it tastes straight like up. a strawberry milkshake. It tastes better than a strawberry milkshake. So if it's, it's so good, it's ridiculous. Okay, you got a blind taste test. You got all the protein that you need. Mm -hmm. Here you go, and then you have um, blind taste test, uh -huh. right? You got to imagine because yeah, you know yeah, the yeah. difference. I get it. So you have a, a, a cup. Yeah. Of warrior kid milk, strawberry, adult. We'll just yeah. we'll just say milk. Yeah. Strawberry. Mm -hmm. Right. Which one are you gonna choose? Which one are you you you? you? I think I'm gonna go for the adult. I thought you were gonna throw a a, a Hagen Dazs strawberry shake in oh, there. Yeah. No. But here's the deal. I'm not picking the Hagen Dazs. It's too much. It's too much. It's too much. Yeah, that's kind of why I didn't say it. And it's not even it's not even too much in a good way. It's too much in a bad way. Right. It's like, yeah. it's like you don't want to drink it. Mm -hmm. The strawberry milk, you're like, Pfft. just pounding it. Yeah. Guilt <laughs> free. Dessert. Actually feeling good about things yeah. afterwards. Interesting. All right. Well, I'm going to try that one because I, I have not actually. Wait, did, I think he might have. He should have put some in the mail. It, yeah. just, it just came out. I have not tried it yet, but I will report back yeah. 100%. Jocko oh. White Tea as well. Yes. Don't forget about that. Yeah, It'll get you an 8,000 pound deadlift, which is no big deal to some people. To me, it's kind of a big deal. And it's organic, by the way. So, you know. Yeah, 100% organic. You know, certified. Check. Also, yes, we have a store. Mm. Jocko has a store. Yeah. So I made a video. It was fun uh, uh, about it. it was nothing like super in depth, but, you know, I got all our friends, training partners, <laughs> yeah. and, you yeah. know, our people. Who you got? Noah. Noah. Oliver. <laughs> Noah's got good arm locks. Yeah. He's actually been like, I mean, on top of Greg McIntyre, he's been kind of my tr main training partner oh, recently, Greg. the past few months. Um, yeah, the main one. Yeah. Uh, so him, yes, Noah Oliver, Greg McIntyre. Greg Train. Is in there. We got Nadine. Nadine. Belgian. Nadine. Belgium. Nadine um, Tim Ford. Did I say Greg McIntyre? Greg He's Train. all up yep. in there. Yeah. Oh, you got Dave Burke. Good deal, Dave. Yeah. <laughs> Good deal, Dave's in there. Jamie's in there. Jamie. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then the kids. Sh uh, can we say who's kids there? There's some kids in there. We'll just say there's some kids yeah. in there, yes. They're not my kids. They're not Echo kids. But they're, they're not kids. my kids, yeah. They're warrior kids. We know they're that. They're warrior kids, 100,000%. Sure. Um, sure. Yeah. So, yeah, Nadine's in there. Tim's there. Uh, anyway, the, the point is they're just our friends. It was just a cool, fun video. Mm -hmm. Jocko Store, you want you want something, get, or if you like something, get something. Nonetheless, JockoStore.com, this is where you can get the shirts that say Discipline Equals Freedom if you want to represent in the wild. On the path. How's this? When I was, um, this was a while ago. So my, my, I had an extra uh, shirt mm -hmm. later on. It was a size medium for. That's what you were. <laughs> <laughs> See, what's funny is I knew you were going to say that. Yeah. I knew you were going to say something like that. Yeah. Anyway, I'm taking pictures for this. You know, you got to take pictures for the products, yeah. right? For the store. And for whatever reason, the size medium, that's the best looking size, I guess, for pictures. I don't know. Nonetheless, take the picture of it, but I have it laying around, mm -hmm. right? So my wife is like, oh, this is an extra shirt. And, you know, can I give it to, like, one of my friends or whatever? Mm -hmm. And I wasn't, I had no use for the shirt at this point. Mm -hmm. And I said no. Because I don't know if their friend is, like, going to represent. You know, oh, I don't know if the friend yeah, is yeah, on yeah. the path. Yeah. What if the friend's not on the path and they're wearing that shirt? That's, you know, it's different. There's more to it. Check. That's what it feels like. You see what I'm saying? It's a true story. Nonetheless, when you are on the path and you want to represent, in the wild, you just go to JockoStore.com. I was at the Joe Rogan show. Sure. The 420. Uh, yeah, the yeah. 420 in San Diego. I was with Peter Atia. Yeah. And we were with a bunch of other dudes. Sure. And Peter Atia was reminding me that on Twitter, somebody had said, hey, Jocko, I wasn't in the SEAL teams, but I want to show support to the SEALs. Is it cool? If I wear like a Navy SEAL trident on my hat or t-shirt and my response was 
I was in the SEAL teams for 20 years, and I don't wear a SEAL team hat or T-shirt. Well, yeah. <laughs> so, Wait, so does that mean yes or no? That means no. <laughs> yeah, hell no, right? Because, okay, so it, coincidentally, me and Good Deal Dave Burke were talking about the exact same thing. So I forget how we ended up talking about it, but I was like, hey, what's the... What's this? Because he gave me his uniform. I was doing something with oh, yeah. it for video wise. And uh, so I don't know, for whatever reason, we ended up talking about but like, what can you wear? Mm -hmm. Like, what can you not wear? What's off limits? Yeah. You know, on this thing. And he told me is like, you know, some stuff. And uh, but I don't know. So yeah. he had to sort of explain it to me. And that's essentially the scenario he painted. He was like, you know, how like the Navy SEALs, like they have the trident. Yeah. Like you can't just put on a trident. No. You know, like like if you're to not that you bring the trident here, but let's say for whatever reason you brought, I can't just grab it and like kind of put it on even as like for fun <laughs> no. you know it's like bro that's kind of off limits no, off you know limits. you can't and then so he made the comparison to jujitsu belts too like if i grabbed your black belt and put it on granted you're kind of my friend i could never you like, wouldn't even let's put on say, the black belt let's say i wasn't let's say i wasn't even a white belt let's say i was like even like a purple belt mm -hmm. And my instructor, who I wasn't necessarily personal friends with, but that was happened to be my instructor. I can't put that belt on. What if he was? What if you forgot your belt? He was injured, and he was on the sidelines, and he was like, "I'll oh, just wear mine." Yeah. Would you wear it? He would never do that. But and what's funny is Dave Burke brought that exact scenario up, different uh -huh. colors though. So yeah, good question. Well, someone was it? like, "Hey, just wear mine. It's a blue belt." He said, "His uh, the guy he was training with, I think it was a blue belt uh -huh. that he was training with. He was like, hey, I have an extra one. You don't have a belt. You need a belt to, to you know, to train yeah. and stuff like that. Gives him his blue belt. Dave Burke said, out of respect for the guy's, like, you know, suggestion, he wore it, but he did not feel good about yeah, it at all. Yeah, and I think, I think that's kind of the deal, where if some higher yeah. belt gives you your You know what I used result. to give guys at, like, in the days, if they started training, I'd mm -hmm. give them a, a piece of one-inch tubular nylon, green. Yeah. Which so, is just like to tie their belt. Do That's you remember like Cameron? He's a yeah. Navy SEAL, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Cam. Yeah, Cam. Good jiu-jitsu, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Good so, wrestler and strong. Yes. So, you know, he came to my, this is a guy, do you know Cameron came to my house and tamed the beast? You know what that, you know what that is with kettlebell? Mm -mm. Tame the beast, you get the 48 kilogram kettlebell, yes. which you don't have one that big. Yes, I, do. I do. Wait, 48 is No, you don't. I'll have a 90 pound one. So I have one, but sure. before I had those, mm -hmm. he ordered one and he was like, in between houses at the time. So he so he ordered and had it sent to my house. He gets it, he comes to my house. First time he's ever picked up a 48 kilogram, 106 pound kettlebell. Mm. And there's a thing called taming the beast, which is you do a press with that kettlebell, you do a pistol with that kettlebell, and then you do a pull up with that kettlebell. The first time he ever did it, he mm. did it. He did it right he in front did of me. All, did it all, all right, in front. like no warm up. Yeah, just boom, just did it. Yeah, and that's, that's saying camp. a lot because he's not a large. Guy. Like I'm bigger than him. He's like a what? Uh, one ninety five. Yeah, maybe and not even. Maybe one ninety. Yeah, uh, yeah. I might give him like one. Nonetheless, yeah. That's, super, that's super good. Guy. Saying a lot. Yeah. Nonetheless, the point I bring him up is because the first time he ever trained geek, because I trained with him before, yeah. and I was like, oh, this guy's probably at the time this was years ago. I was like. You were a probably, purple belt? I was a purple belt. Yeah. So I was like, this guy's probably a, like a purple belt too. Yeah. So, you know, whatever, I trained with him. One day he comes in in the gi. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, oh, shoot, you know, yeah, that little party is like, kind of like, oh, yeah, you know, let me confirm, you know, whatever. But he has a piece of that green, that I dark green. <laughs> <laughs> around his top. And here's the thing. Yeah. It doesn't just stand out because yeah. it's like it's kind of dark or whatever. Yeah. But you see new guy come, you know, because he's sort of, you know, how when you come and train for the first time in gi yeah. in some class, it's kind of like most of those people, they kind of yeah, go there. From each other. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. But this guy's a new guy. I knew who he was. So I was like looking at him like, OK, that's obviously a military piece of equipment it's not a belt <laughs> it was funny the looks on everyone's face though like yeah. this like they're kind of looking at each other like yeah, what like can you do that you know like crazy. what's going has the whole world gone <laughs> the crazy whole world. yeah it's really funny but that's how rigid the belt situation is though yes. that's why you can't just grab a guy's belt and as i know people not specific people but it would stand to reason put it that way it would stand to reason that even as a joke if i grabbed like you know what's funny? As a joke, mm. I've been like, here, just wear mine. Like some people, you know, I've just been like giving people my black belt, like, yeah. oh, you know, like yeah. a like a blue belt or a purple. Like, here, you just yeah. wear mine, and I give it to me, like like awkwardly, yeah, yeah. awkwardly make them do it. <laughs> <laughs> but that's that how that's the dynamics of that, you know. Before I really Same knew thing. Jeff Glover, 
Yeah. He came down here and did a seminar. Mm -hmm. and he's like, "Hey, I don't have a belt." And I was like, "Yeah, you can use mine." And I was re I was actually worried. Yeah, because I, I, I I've only had one belt. Yeah, I've only had one belt my whole time, like one black belt. Mm -hmm. And I was worried. I was like, "Dang." I mean, not that I thought he was gonna like steal it, but I just was afraid. Oh, you know, he's gonna throw, you know he'll he'll yeah. put it in his bag, and next thing you know, it's in Santa Barbara, and the next thing you know, I'll never see my belt again, my special yeah. belt. Yeah, I was there for that day when yeah. he did it because I longer. wasn't here though. I wasn't here. That was the part I like was here and I had to go. Yeah, and so I didn't get to, but he he hung it back up, Jeffy Glover. Yeah, took care of. His I brother. took a picture of him that day. Oh, really? We'll have yeah. to see if he's wearing my belt. He is wearing your belt oh, in the yeah, picture, yeah, yeah. and he's doing this, and that picture ended up being used for a bunch of different really? stuff. Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. that's kind of cool. Then my belt made it kind of yep. famous with Jeffy. If Glover. you notice, like the belt is a little bit long. It's funny. Oh yeah, because I'm thicker than he is. Yeah. Well, you have like an A. What you know, the belt comes A three. Yeah. yeah. And he's probably he's an A one for sure because he's yeah. one fifty five. Yep. There it is. So don't do that. Don't. There don't was wear a guy. There was training. a guy at SEAL Team Two who is a just an incredibly well respected guy in the days. <laughs> and he had, I think he had two sons, and he was giving them like a like a hat, like a SEAL Team Two hat or something that had a trident on it. Mm -hmm. Or he had an old one that he was gonna, giving to his sons. Like, hey, I'm not going to wear this and it's too old. And he made them cut the trident off of it <laughs> if they wanted to wear it. <laughs> I was like, yes, man. legit. Yeah, man. I dig it. And there's all those kinds of things. You know, like if even on a super lower level, like, you know, if you made it through some little thing, mm -hmm. like, a, I don't know, like one of these Spartan races or something that yeah. you only get this shirt or hat if you did it. Yeah. You know, and. Even then, there's a little. I mean, it's it's way more loose for sure. Yeah. But you know, like your wife puts it on or something. You're like people you like to represent do that. that. Yeah, man. I know that's my all. daughter. I know my daughter representing that state, the state <laughs> wrestling championships. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Those kids up there, they're buying those shirts and sweatshirts. Yeah. I got read about. What if you came home and your wife had your trident on? Why would my wife have my just because she's trying to represent? Well, I'll just take it from her. <laughs> <laughs> no, there actually, there's a thing where there's a thing where like a seal will give his wife like a little necklace with a trident on it. Yeah, it's like hey, you know that's sort of there. Why? So she doesn't take his. To be cool. No, I don't think she'd be trying to take his, but I think it's just you know little appreciation. Yeah, fully. But no, but no, my uh, your wife knows what's up. Yeah, no, my wife doesn't have one of those. <laughs> yeah, I know she doesn't. Makes sense. So that's kind of how it is, right? Yeah. With the shirts from Jocko's store, kind of. I mean, not I, to that level, but I put it this way. If I see someone wearing, representing, I know that they're representing. I know they're on the path yeah. right there. They're not just some guy who, person or whatever that's not on the path. It doesn't seem like that. To oh, they're me. definitely in the game. Yes. For sure. Yeah. They're definitely in the game. That's what it feels they're like. they're wearing a shirt. Boom. So there you go. Also, subscribe to the podcast if you haven't already. I know it seems obvious, but apparently it's not as obvious. From what I gather, nonetheless, yeah. subscribe if you haven't already. Yeah, and by the way, that's if you get a piece of gear, it supports the podcast. Is that important? Well, is it important? Hmm, depends on what you mean by important. So yes, yeah. I support. mean, it's important hey. to let people know that the one additional bonus of representing is you're actually helping out the podcast support. We're gonna get a new table, by the way. Oh yeah. So Which has been ordered. Yeah, this one yeah, wiggles a lot. It's ridiculous. Yeah. So. Echo Charles's table. Well, this is one of those things where, like, a, an apt punishment would be you had to bring this to your house and use it as your dining room table <laughs> for a god. year. Oh my gosh. No, yeah. That, yeah. Yeah. Why would you even think out. this is a good table? I, you know, the picture looked nice. <laughs> Check. All right, so we're gonna get a new table. If you buy a T-shirt, we can get a new table that's not gonna fall down yeah. and all that. But we appreciate that support too. And when you're subscribing to podcast, check out the Warrior Kid podcast. The Warrior Kid podcast is aimed at kids, but I promise you that Uncle Jake has lessons for everyone. And also, we have a kid, a warrior kid named Aiden, and he's making soap here in California. IrishOaksRanch.com. If you want to get some. Some soap, some Jocko soap, so that you can stay clean. The guy, he has a new one too, Trooper soap. Trooper soap, yeah. yeah. Different. Has a different rope deal. on it. Soap and a rope. Piece of 550 cord, by the way. <laughs> Layers, for Layers sure. Layers, for sure. Yeah, yeah, that's some good stuff, by the way. Also, YouTube. We do have a YouTube channel. 
if you're interested in the video version of this podcast, if you want to see what this table looks like, the weak table, it looks okay. Actually, you can't I don't see know. It you can't there. really can, see yeah. it. Yeah. Nonetheless, you can see how wiggly all the books yeah. on the table and the microphone. Yeah. Is kind of good. <laughs> Nonetheless, if you're interested in the video version of this podcast, that's where you can find it. Also, some excerpts on there. If you don't want to watch the whole podcast at once, you know, some excerpts on there, little lessons that you may have found important. You can kind of revisit those. Also got psychological warfare. Everyone that asked for an alarm clock with my voice on it, telling them to wake up or whatever, mm-hmm. that's get the psychological warfare soundtrack, mm-hmm. the psychological warfare album mm-hmm. on iTunes or Google Play or MP3 platforms. And there's a bunch of things on there of me telling you the right thing to do and yeah. why you should do the right thing. Okay. So check that out. Also check out Flipside Canvas. My brother Dakota Meyer is making art. Sure. Is that the right word? Yes, it is. Good. He's making art and putting art on canvases and vinyl posters that you can hang up and you can remind yourself that discipline equals freedom. You can remind yourself that all your excuses are lies. Yeah, well, that that's really good because a lot of people were, and we have posters yeah, for sure yeah. on you know the store. But this is a little bit. It's like one, two, maybe like three or four levels better, uh, better. than yeah. you know a poster. Yeah. Posters, posters are cool, man. Like, of course, you hang them in your gym, whatever. This, this is, is like, next level. Yeah, it's like a level or yeah, m- levels multiple go. levels. Up. Yeah. Flipside com- flipside canvas dot com, and also support Dakota Meyer for crying out loud. Yeah, big time. Also, on it, on it.com slash Jocko. This is where you can get fitness gear, kettlebells. I recently posted a picture of my newest kettlebell, Stormtrooper, mm-hmm. which I talked I about. I saw that I, picture. Yeah, it was a good picture. On it posted it as like a picture oh, on their thing. You made it big time. Oh, big, oh, huge time. Made my day big time. Kind of the guy now all of a sudden. <laughs> nah, no, but... You know, nonetheless, it happened. Um, but yeah, you can get you know kettlebells on there, some ropes, some battle ropes. They got some good like immunity supplements too. That's the one I actually have been religiously taking. This Shroom Tech Immune. Check. Yeah, Check. you got to take that one, especially if you're doing travel. Nonetheless, a lot of good good stuff on there. On it. dot com slash Jocko. Have a little book coming out called Way the Warrior Kid Three: Where There's a Will. It is available for pre-order right now. If you want to help me and you want the book, please pre-order it so that I know how many to print. I yeah. failed miserably when it came to Mikey and the Dragons. Mikey and the Dragons, I didn't make enough. I ended up having to scramble to make more. I apologize. We got them to everyone by Christmas, but it was uh, it was not smooth. It was a little bit of a nightmare. So total failure on my part. This time, Way the Warrior Kid 3, Where There's a Will, Check out that book, pre-order it now. It's coming out May 28th, by the way. So we're almost there. Mm. But I can make more quickly. Quickly enough to have them ready for you if you pre-order it. Anyways, also The Way of the Warrior Kid and Mark's Mission. Those are the first two books in that series. Mikey and the Dragons, best book ever for little kids in the history of ever. That's confirmed, by the way. Mm -hmm. And the Field Manual, the Discipline Equals Freedom Field Manual, that's a book about how to get after it, no matter where you are in your life. It's a great place to start, or to keep you to start on the path, or to keep you on the path. The audio version of that is on iTunes, Amazon Music, Google Play. Extreme Ownership, first book I wrote with my brother Leif Babin. The Dichotomy of Leadership, a second book I wrote with my brother Leif Babin. Echelon Front, that's our leadership consultancy. We solve problems through leadership. That's what we do. Go to echelonfront.com. The muster, May 23rd and 24th, sold out, done. That's in Chicago, September 19th and 20th in Denver. That one is going to sell out. So is Sydney, December 4th and 5th. If you want to come to the muster, extremeownership.com. That's where the details are. They're all going to sell out. All of them have sold out and all of them will sell out. So if you want to come, get on there and get registered. EF Online, I already talked about that. The EF Overwatch, this is where we take leaders from special operations, from combat aviation, and we place them into companies that need leadership inside their organization. So you don't always wanna hire someone just because they've been working in some industry for a long time. Hire someone that has leadership capability and then get them up to speed on the industry. These guys are proven combat leaders. They can step up and take you to the place you need. EFOverwatch.com. And 
if you want to cruise with us. Hardcore, by the way, hardcore cruising, which is my recommended level of cruising. From time to time, rest between sets. We're on the interwebs, Twitter, Instagram, and on Facebook. <laughs> you thought I was going to do it like you, didn't mm-hmm. you? Anyway, I'm at Echo Charles. And Jocko's at Jocko Willink on all of them. And thanks to all our military folks out there that are on the front lines of Freedom Standing Watch. And thanks to police and law enforcement, firefighters, paramedics, EMTs, dispatchers, correctional officers, border patrol, secret service. And all first responders who maintain vigilance 24 hours a day, 365 days a year to keep us safe here at home. And to everyone else out there, remember some of those lessons from Field Marshal Montgomery. Remember to cut through the overlying difficulties and see the essentials of what you need to do. And then take a dispassionate, a dispassionate view of good things and bad things that are going to assail you. And use your force of will to keep getting after it. And until next time, this is Echo and Jocko. Out.